Good morning. Thanks for coming back. I, I hope uh, you, you enjoyed the workshop yesterday. I think it was very fascinating. I'm personally an electrical and computer engineering faculty member here at the University of Louisville. And uh, the industrial decarbonization uh, is a kind of a new topic for me. I haven't seen too many presentations on that. It's very fascinating work. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the concepts of uh, using clean hydrogen and fuel cells uh, from the various perspectives, I really, you know, took a lot away from the uh, talk. So today we're going to transition a little bit in, in, in scope and we're going to talk about, you know, more of the power system side uh, and focus on the, on the bigger topic of microgrids, small scale power systems, and, and, and put, a, put a tilt to that uh, to really focus on low carbon. So a microgrid that uh, has, you know, diesel generators as a base load, is that really, you know, a low carbon system? So obviously right now in uh, 2022, 2023, there are companies that are, uh, you know, selling microgrid solutions to people, and, and you're going to hear some of that today. Uh, and, and as we look into the future and the, and the hydrogen-based economy, you know, how do we make those systems uh, even more uh, green uh, and, and low carbon? So we're so grateful to have all of our speakers today, and then we're gonna also going to have a panel after those speakers. Uh, so, so please write down your questions. We want to have a good interactive session. And I have some questions prepared as well. So, so our first speaker is uh, Mr. Uh, David um, Boff. He's a director of uh, partner engagement with Bloom Energy. Uh, so David's bio is out there, so you, you're you're welcome to read that. But um, but you know, as his role as director of partner engagement, David recruits, onboards, and trains, and creates uh, mutual value propositions for his partners. Um, David's extensive knowledge uh, of the energy market. Uh, allows him to provide and promote Bloom's uh, solid oxide, oxide fl uh, fuel cell technology for the microgrid market. So welcome, David. Thank you so much for coming. For you. Thank you, Mike. Searching, searching. It'll come. All right. Let's go back one slide. Well, good morning. Um, how do I get the notes up on here? Yeah, that's weird. It's not showing up. That's right. We'll just wing it. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, as Mike mentioned, my name is David Baugh, uh, Director of Partner Engagement at Bloom Energy. <laughs> I do work with a variety of partners, uh, such as EPC firms, utilities, advisory firms, financiers, you name it, um, to look for ways to work together um, within the microgrid market, um, whether that's on the engineering side, the construction, the installation side. There's a variety of different partners. Uh, and as we all know, we cannot do this alone. Uh, pleasure to be here today and I appreciate you guys letting me speak. Um, so, a summary. Why am I showing you a summary for talking about microgrids? All right, three reasons. Uh, the first one uh, is, well, it's a summary, it's nuclear, so that's a clean carbon free source of energy. Um, two, if we do not solve uh, for the negative impacts of climate change, this may be the only safe place we could be. Uh, and three, I actually served on this one. Um, see, there's me driving it. That's, that's, actually, that's actually how it works, right? Um, and I, I do like to tell submarine stories and submarine jokes before I start any speech, so uh, here's the one that I prepared for today. Uh, submarines are a lot like work. Once you open windows, that's when the problems begin. <laughs> All right, excellent. Um, so today, I'll give a quick overview uh, of Bloom Energy. Um, we'll talk about what low carbon sources of generation really means. Um, I've got a microgrid, a solid oxide fuel cell microgrid case study to go over. Talk a bit about fuel flexibility within solid oxide fuel cell technology. Um, we'll talk a little bit about electrolyzer and our pure hydrogen fuel cell. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about carbon and heat capture. And then we'll kind of close out with some incentives of why this is important today. A bit about Bloom. Uh, so Bloom was founded back in 2001. Um, we are located headquartered out of San Jose, California, um, although we have a manufacturing plant in Newark, Delaware, and we've got several offices uh, globally. 
Um, we're about a billion dollar top line revenue company, uh, continue to grow at a rate of about 30% year over year. Uh, we have one gigawatt of total install base and we've spent a considerable amount of money <coughs> in R&D over the past decade to make sure that we have products ready for the market before the market's ready for them. And I think now is the time. So fuel cells, how do they work? At a basic level, um, what we're really doing is, let's just show you here, a little prop. If I can get it out. Get it. So this is about the size, if I can not tear my jacket apart. Yeah, there we go. Fuel cell, about the size of a drink coaster. <coughs> All right, much, much thinner than this, but that's basically what it looks like. Um, the fuel cell is made up of an electrolyte in the center, uh, which for solid oxide, Bloom's technology is, is made out of ceramic. Um, very simple materials, uh, no rare metals, uh, so it's easy to get this material. Um, on either side of the electrolyte is, a, is painted inks. Uh, we have an anode and a cathode side. On the anode side, what we're basically doing is flowing a source of fuel that contains hydrogen across the anode and then oxygen from the outside air across the cathode side. <coughs> that reaction basically recombines the oxygen with the hydrogen to form water, heat, and electricity, and, and a bit of carbon. Um, so the way that the system is put together is you basically have a fuel cell. Those fuel cells go into stacks. The stacks of fuel cells go into a power module, and then the energy server system is made up of multiple power modules. Okay, so and this diagram, what you're looking at on the bottom right, <coughs> is a 300 kilowatt uh, Bloom energy server. It's made up of six 50 kilowatt power modules, and then it has a fuel processing module and an AC output module. Uh, so 300 kilowatts powers approximately 200, 250 average size homes, and it can fit in the space of two parking spots. So it's, it's a very power dense technology as compared to things like solar or wind. <coughs> um, so this is what it looks like, um, just to kind of give you a sense of the versatility of the product. Um, solid oxide technology being very power dense, uh, it is very versatile. Um, you can see on the top left, that's a typical utility installation. Uh, that installation there is approximately 30 megawatts. Um, the top middle, uh, just to kind of demonstrate the fact that it can run in, in various temperature ranges. Um, they can be installed in cold weather, they can be installed in hot weather. Uh, in cold weather, there's no smoke, there's nothing emitted, uh, so it doesn't look like a, you know, a big recip engine or a diesel engine. That's uh, very, very quiet uh, and very, very clean. Uh, typical data center uh, application on the top right there. Um, rooftop installations are becoming very popular. If you look on the bottom left, um, we basically crane lift the system. Uh, as long as mechanically it can be supported, we can install it pretty much anywhere. Um, a lot of our customers like to showcase the technology. Uh, it, is, it has been around for a long time, but folks are really proud of this, right? It's an emerging technology. They want to demonstrate the fact that they are running a low carbon electricity you know, production system, and, and they like to showcase it. It's pretty sleek looking. It uh, doesn't look like a typical industrial uh, generator. <coughs> um, we can install these in residential zones. Um, so if you look on the bottom middle, uh, the edge of that energy server is 12 feet from that window. Um, so while there's still a security fence um, we, are, we are permitted uh, for most residential zones in the markets that we work, um, which is somewhat unique. Uh, think of a diesel generator sitting there, plugging away, uh, not gonna happen, right? Um, and then the bottom right, uh, this is a remote installation. Um, so this is completely off the grid. There's no grid connection at all. Uh, this is for a uh, classified customer, let's just put it that way, uh, but, but very resilient. Um, it does not reply, uh, rely on the electrical grid connection at all. All right, talk a bit about carbon reduction. Um, so solid oxide fuel cell technology, um, first off, it doesn't produce any NOx, SOx, or volatile organic compounds. Uh, so from a greenhouse gas and ozone depleting uh, perspective, um, doesn't produce any of those uh, harmful uh, chemicals. Um, from a carbon emission standpoint, uh, historically and conventionally, our systems run using natural gas as the feedstock. Um, so there is some carbon emission. Uh, but it's about half uh, the carbon emissions as compared to the U.S. grid today. Um, and it's about half as compared to a combined cycle engine uh, or even a gas turbine. Um, when we run off biogas, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, um, it's actually a carbon neutral source of, uh, of, of electricity. 
All right, so let's kind of swing into microgrids and how this all fits together. Um, so if you look at this uh, illustration, um, the microgrid is really capable of aggregating multiple sources of distributed technology um, into a microgrid application that can be controlled by a centralized microgrid controller. Um, <coughs> solid oxide fuel cells are a great fit into microgrids because they run 24-7, 365. So solid oxide is not a technology that starts up and shuts down quickly. Uh, solid oxide runs at approximately 800 degrees Celsius inside the power modules and can take up to a day to get up to full temperature. So this is not a source of backup generation. Uh, it is dispatchable. It does have load falling characteristics and it does have the ability to island. Um, but it really covers the base load. Um, so while you have intermittent technologies like wind and solar, um, you can introduce the fuel cell to provide for your base load power. You can introduce storage to use for, for some of those renewables. And, and now you've got, you know, 24-7, 365 uh, resilient energy in your microgrid. Um, so <coughs> uh, an actual real world example. Um, so a project that I helped develop last year uh, was for a company called Taylor Farms Fresh Foods. Uh, Taylor Farms Fresh Foods, they make those bagged salads and, and things like that. You've probably seen them at the supermarket. Um, the CEO, Bruce Taylor, um, was very, let's put it this way, unhappy with his utility company. Um, this is in San Juan Batista, California. Uh, so this is in PG&E territory. PG&E, great company, not trying to knock them. Um, but Bruce Taylor thought he was paying entirely too much for his electricity. He felt like he wasn't getting the service that he deserved. Uh, based on the fact that he's got multiple facilities and he came to Bloom and said, look, can you take me off the grid? And we said, entirely? And he said, yep, entirely. I want to cut the cable. Um, so this is what we designed. Um, this is a, a food production facility. Uh, it's, it's about a six megawatt total load. Um, so we had a six megawatt uh, microgrid. We've got a, a two megawatt, four megawatt hour battery storage system. Um, we installed alongside the fuel cells 1.8 megawatts of solar panels. Um, and, and don't pay too much attention to that diesel. <laughs> um, at, at the end of the project, to kind of put the full technical solution together, um, we felt it necessary to have additional backup generation just because of the sensitivity of his equipment and the fact that he was completely cutting the cord with utility, which he's never really done before. So we had a mobile diesel generator that can be pulled up to the site and plugged in to, to cover two megawatts of critical base load power. Um, all of these are aggregated uh, through a microgrid, uh, microgrid controller, um, basically feeding his facility 24-7, 365. Um, the cool part about this is um, not only did we provide for, uh, for Taylor Farms the resiliency benefits they were looking for, but we're saving them $54 million over 15 years uh, based on the cost of electricity produced by the fuel cell being less expensive than the grid. Um, which is about a 21% return on investment in just over a four year payback period. Uh, so pretty, pretty strong economics along with the fact that it's you know, low carbon solution. Um, reliability, very, very high reliability based on the, the technical solution we developed. Um, from a sustainability perspective, um, saving about 5,600 tons of CO2 reduced each year just at this plant um, and 99 plus reduction uh, in water usage. <coughs> um, so speaking of water, Solid oxide fuel cells do not use water during operation. Uh, they draw water and startup. That water uh, is heated up by the catalyst reaction. Um, and that water turns to steam. The steam stays within the system uh, to drive what's called steam reformation, uh, which is the process of extracting hydrogen from the methane. Um, so we don't actually use water during operation. Um, so <coughs> a bit more about how solid oxide fuel cell technology can take you from low carbon to zero carbon. Um, so our, our solid oxide fuel cell today, as I mentioned, can cut the carbon emissions in half as compared to the US grid on average, uh, and even more as compared to combustion technologies. Um, but we, what we can also do is we can blend hydrogen uh, with either the natural gas or biofuels. Um, so now you've reduced your carbon even more. Um, and then ultimately, uh, when hydrogen comes to a price point and accessibility, um, we can now introduce pure hydrogen to run the fuel cell, which is completely zero carbon solution. Um, a really cool part about that is we can do that without actually having to remove and replace the system. 
uh, it's a field modification where we would go in individually pull out power modules replace the stacks with ones that are designed for fuel cells that run off pure hydrogen as opposed to a blend um, and then we can bring the system back up in operation so it's not a capital intensive uh, operation to go from natural gas to blending to pure hydrogen a little bit about biogas um, we talked to, talked a bit about that yesterday uh, it is a valuable byproduct of decomposing organic waste However, left untreated, it is a very dangerous pollutant. Um, so traditional methods involve things like venting, flaring, uh, combustion with an engine uh, or pipeline injection, um, following a, a good amount of cleanup, which is also capital intensive. Um, and just some quick facts there, the US produces uh, greater than 70 million tons of organic waste each year. Uh, so there's a great opportunity uh, to look at the biogas sector as a means to uh, provide for low carbon uh, microgrid generation technologies. Um, so, so what do we do instead uh, with, that, with that biogas? Um, we basically work with companies to install anaerobic digesters uh, at landfills, dairy farms, wastewater treatment plants. Uh, we use specialized purification equipment uh, to clean out the sulfur and other contaminants that will poison the fuel cell stacks. And then we basically feed the biogas directly into the fuel cell uh, to produce clean electricity. A little bit more about the solid oxide platform. Um, the platform itself, and we did touch on this yesterday during a presentation, um, it can produce electricity, but the platform can also produce hydrogen. Um, so if you think about electrolysis, uh, as opposed to electrical production, if you introduce electricity to split the water into air and uh, into oxygen and hydrogen, you've got an electrolyzer. Um, if you want to produce electricity, now you're introducing a source of hydrogen and oxygen to produce the electricity. Um, so it's not an entirely different system. It's really the same platform, the same technology. You're just reversing the inputs to get different outputs. So this is what our electrolyzer looks like. Looks just like a fuel cell. Imagine that. Um, so, so basically, as I mentioned, what we would do is use renewable energy uh, as our electricity source uh, to split that water to produce clean hydrogen. Um, that clean hydrogen can be used for things like hydrogen fuel cells, or I'm sorry, hydrogen uh, fuel cell vehicles. Uh, it can be injected in the pipeline. And then of course you have zero carbon electrical production from a pure hydrogen fuel cell. A bit about carbon capture. So here's another way that we can reduce our carbon footprint. Um, our systems, as, as well as other solid oxide technologies, are very well suited for carbon capture. And we've actually modified our system to be carbon capture ready, <clears throat> meaning it's accessible and easy to connect uh, carbon capture equipment. Um, there's no drying that's required, which is typical of carbon capture for combustion technologies. <clears throat> and the purity of the CO2 is, is, is around 95%, which is very, very high. So it's simplistic and it's much less expensive to capture the carbon from solid oxide technology as compared to typical combustion sources. And um, that, that uh, CO2 could be sequestered uh, or it can be utilized. Along those same lines, uh, we've also adapted our system uh, to provide for combined heat and power. Um, for, for a long time, uh, Bloom anyway, um, was kind of working against CHP. You know, we, we felt that having a 65% beginning of life electrical efficiency um, was more advantageous than trying to utilize some of that heat. But what we realize over time is that we're missing out on particular applications in the market. Um, there, is, there is definitely market opportunities, even if our system doesn't produce as much heat as typical combined heat and power and doesn't have as high of a flow rate. If you have an application that can harness that energy, um, we can go from a 54% average electrical efficiency uh, up to 85% overall system efficiency uh, by harnessing that heat. Um, and there's kind of a simple diagram of what that looks like. Um, we, basically install piping and exhaust uh, on the top of the energy servers. Uh, that heat goes through uh, a damper, goes through a heat exchanger, uh, and then can be used to, to uh, provide thermal energy for the facility's needs, whatever that might be. Okay, so why is now the right time, right? Why am I talking about fuel cells? Um, well, thanks to the, uh, thanks to the IRA, um, <clears throat> there's an incentive tax credit through the federal government um, and it's up to 50% uh, incentive tax credit for fuel cell technology, which is huge. It's game-changing huge. Um, 
right off the get-go, we have 30% incentive tax credit if, if we satisfy prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements, which we do anyway. Um, but there's 10% additional bonus based on your domestic content, which uh, Bloom Energy's fuel cell is, is manufactured and produced in the United States, and we're going through a process to validate that now. Um, and then you can get an additional 10% incentive tax credit um, for locations that are in an energy community. Uh, and there's certain definitions of energy uh, community. Um, further on top of that, um, the definition of energy property, which qualifies for this particular tax credit, um, it includes the fuel cell stack assembly balance of plant pull system. It also includes the microgrid controllers. Uh, it can include the interconnection property for projects that are under five megawatts. Um, and, and we can also qualify the biogas purification equipment as, as part of that uh, incentive tax credit as well. Uh, so where before it was just the base system technology, uh, now we've got all these ancillaries that also qualify for the same, the same tax benefit. Um, so now is definitely the time. Um, solid oxide technology, as I mentioned, has been around for 50, 60, 70 plus years. Um, but now we've got the ability to really put that out into the market and utilize that as a base load uh, microgrid, low carbon uh, source of electricity. And that's all I've got. Happy to take some questions. Good morning, Kevin Din from NREL. I was wondering what your um, cost of hydrogen is from uh, your you know, SLFC, your, your product, before and after the um, all the credits and so on. Right, so the cost of reduced hydrogen today with our electrolyzer is about $3.50. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's you know, we're also trying to get down, right, as we, as we reduce our system costs, we talked about quite a bit yesterday. Uh, to get down even lower, but where we started off, it was you know astronomical <laughs> on what it costs to produce hydrogen. But right now we're sitting at about three dollars and fifty cents. Um, after tax credit, yep, after tax credit. That's a great question. All right, uh, thank you, Wilhelm Dean Emeritus of Speed School of Engineering. Um, I was curious about maintenance. Okay, you say you you run twenty four seven, three six five. Yeah. Uh, what's the time between shutdown for maintenance and SRD shutdown for maintenance? Well, we actually don't, uh, so I'll explain how that works. Um, the, the real maintenance that gets performed is uh, we change out the air filters and the doors of the unit. Um, there's only one moving part, and it's the air blower. Um, so the air blower, you know, it's not, it's not a high temperature application, so the bearings don't wear out. It's more of a visual inspection. Um, lots of visual inspections on wiring harnesses and things like that in general cleanup. The real maintenance comes with replacing the fuel cell stacks. Um, so solid oxide fuel cell technology, the actual fuel cells themselves, will degrade over time just by the process of electrochemical reaction. Okay, so about every six to seven years, those stacks will degrade to a point where we can no longer maintain nameplate capacity, and we will actually go replace those stacks. But the way that we do it is it's modular. So you've got a system that, let, let's say it's the 300 kilowatt system, and you've got six power modules. What we'll do is we'll ramp up the power in five power modules to, to our nameplate capacity. We'll shut down one power module, open the doors, and forklift the entire unit out with all the DC-DC converters, balance of plant, everything, literally with four bolts. And then we put a new one in, we start it up, we bring it up to temperature, it starts exporting power, and then we go to the next one, do the same thing. So we can maintain the system running the entire time. That's, that's really the cost of the maintenance, and that's really the only major maintenance evolution. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, good morning, Jacek Gashinski from the Con Center uh, here at the uh, Blue Field. Uh, uh, you already answered part of my question. I wanted to ask about the durability, and uh, especially that you just mentioned that this, this cells operate at 500, 800 centigrade, which is yeah. a lot of thermal stress. So this is one question about the durability and the, the lifetime. And second, uh, whether there, there are any efforts to integrate uh, piece of, I mean, thermoelectrics to recover the heat from, from these systems operating at such high temperatures. Yeah, so I'll answer the second one first. We're absolutely looking at how to harness and integrate the, the thermal energy. 
Um, like I said, it's somewhat recent that we decided to actually look at uh, combined heat and power or utilizing that heat. So we're very interested in working with third parties to understand exactly how we can bring that to market together, uh, what those companies are, you know, how we can harness it, you know, what are those use cases, uh, and that sort of thing. So that's really in uh, market design phase at this point, but we're absolutely looking that direction. Um, from a durability standpoint, you know, when, when you, if you were to open up a door to this unit and put your hand on what we call a hot box, uh, which, is, which contains the fuel cells, uh, it, it's slightly warm to the touch. Okay, so that, that heat is, is maintained uh, very tightly within the power module for a reason. Uh, we need to maintain that steam uh, within the power module. Um, so from a durability standpoint, we've, we've not experienced anything as far as damage to the power module itself or the hot box or any components within the power module. So it's very well contained, very insulated. Yeah. Good question. Hi, I'm uh, Josh Spurgeon with the Con Center here at the University of Louisville. Um, when your uh, customer wants to go completely remote, like you showed, or the one who wants to get away from the utility altogether, how does that work when your fuel cell runs on natural gas? Are you not still part of the centralized natural gas, and isn't that the utility? Yeah, so typically um, natural gas, you know, being abundant and, and being you know, via utility, um, that, that's where we would typically tap into it. So if we've got a remote customer, we partner with other companies that specialize in the transportation storage and distribution and we can actually bring in compressed natural gas. And we can decompress that natural gas and have it fed there on site. And we've got a couple pilot projects that are doing that right now um, for the DOD. Yep, that's a great question. Hey David, Jacob Benito, Scale Micro. You promised me a softball, sir. <laughs> <laughs> He's a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> so is, uh, is Bloom currently developing or working with a third party to develop the technology necessary to integrate liquefied hydrogen storage in some way, shape, or form into your electrolyzer system. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There's a couple different uh, companies that we're working with to do that exact same thing. Um, you know, we've, we've got the base system ready to go. We know it can run off pure hydrogen, but as far as, you know, how to get that hydrogen there, what that looks like, how do we store it, you know, all, all of those things we're looking at right now, and we do have several partner companies that are helping us with that, because it's definitely not our expertise, uh, but it's definitely needed in order to run our system. So it's a great question, Jake. Hi, uh, Alan Mantooth, University of Arkansas. Um, a very good presentation. A couple of questions about the reliability again. So you mentioned at one point during your talk about upgrading those as, as you would move you know, away from natural gas to pure hydrogen and so forth, but it not being very capital intensive. So can you give me an idea of why that's the case if you're having to replace the stack? Because it seems to be the heart of the system. Yeah, First so question. It's, a, it's a great question. So I'll say, relatively speaking, it's not capital intensive. So there is some cost, obviously, to replacing that stack. Um, but compared to the cost of taking the entire system out and replacing it, along with the infrastructure, it, it's much less expensive. So if you look at some of the other technologies where you may have a turbine that can do, uh, or an engine that can do some hydrogen blending or pure hydrogen, um, I'm not aware of a lot of technologies that have the ability to just replace a particular component in the system versus the entire system. So relatively speaking, it's less capital intensive. Okay. That's a better way to put it. And then my second question related to that, being a power electronics person, you talked about pulling out, you got the DC to DC converters there. So that brings up my question, as we, as we look into the solar-based system, solar PV, we see that the, uh, the solar panels or modules, as they refer to them, are 25-year uh, are lifetime, but the power electronics are like 10 to 15, okay? And so have you had enough experience in the field to see when you're getting power electronic based failures, yeah. like capacitors and other things that are in those systems going out that need to be replaced. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We've, um, you know, we've been testing, we make our own power electronics. Um, so we've got some pretty good extensive background on understanding exactly how those inverters and DC converters are made up. Um, and we do have redundancy built in. So we know, we, right now there's, there's 12 separate inverters that are installed on the AC output module. It's really only using uh, nine to 10 of those to maintain nameplate capacity. So if one inverter were to fail, we're gonna know that. We monitor these systems 24-7, 365 at two different remote uh, control centers. So we're gonna know if one goes down, the other one will pick up for that load immediately, and then we would dispatch a technician to replace it, and then we bring it back and do diagnostics and understand the failure point of that particular inverter. So, yeah, it's a great question. 
Thanks. Uh, excellent talk, by the way. Um, one of the problems that they've had in the past for these fuel cells is the chemical reactions in there basically reducing the effectiveness of the fuel cell conversion. Um, when you pull that stack up, when you get that drop back, are you looking at reconditioning the fuel stacks? What's the um, life cycle of those things? Can you recondition them, get them back up, recycle them, et cetera? That's a great question. I'm actually really glad you asked that question because I wanted to talk about that and I forgot. Um, so we reuse 99% of all the material. Um, so that fuel cell, we, the, when those stacks come back to the factory, we take the whole thing apart. Um, we clean all the inks off both sides of the electrolyte. We run the electrolyte through the same quality inspection checks as we would a brand new one. And then we repaint the inks on them and redeploy them to the field. And each one, each individual stack is RFID. So we know exactly what it was born, where it lived, where it went next and when it comes back. So we, we reuse 99% of the material, yep. Hey, big hand for David. Thank you. That was a great talk, um, and as we get our next speaker set up, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Amir Balabigi. Uh, Dr. Balabigi is a uh, director of analytics for Bright Knight. He has over 10 years of experience in engineering controls analytics for renewable energy projects, including utility scale, solar, energy story, as well as microgrids. Uh, he, leads an he leads the analytics team for Bright Knight and has a deep understanding of renewable energy project mo uh, modeling, optimization, green hydrogen energy storage technologies and power market analytics. So we're grateful to have uh, Dr. Val Valbiki to be here today. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Hey everyone. No. Yeah, you'll need this, one. this one's for the camera. Okay. So just keep it like that. Awesome. There you go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm gonna shift the gears a little bit. Uh, we talked about fuel cell and uh, electrolyzer this morning. Uh, we also talked about, there were very interesting talks yesterday about uh, reaching higher levels of decarbonization. And uh, I think my talk today is a segue into power part of those talks, but with a focus on a very specific segment, which could probably be a little bit ahead of the rest of the game in terms of reaching high levels of decarbonization. In particular, how, how more advanced or high, high targets of getting uh, carbon-free energy by uh, tech companies or corporate energy buyers that have ad advanced targets that are not so far in the future are, can be achieved and uh, what lessons can we learn from those to the, for the broader group? Uh, I'm going to start a little bit with a quick introduction about Bright Knight. We are a renewable power company. Uh, we develop renewable energy projects in the U.S. and globally uh, with a portfolio of mostly PV and energy storage projects. We have uh, a number of wind and non uh, PV storage wind technologies as well across the globe. Uh, about 20 gigawatts of projects in the, in the portfolio in the US in various stages of development. We are active in, in the Kentucky area. We have a number of projects here. We're active in the Midwest in general and we have presence in the US from coast to coast. Projects in the Northwest of the country as well as Midwest and Southwest. A huge presence in the Southwest of the country. Uh, we take pride in being agnostic when it comes to how we deliver the project. It, it could be a combination of different technologies. It could be a combination of uh, different solutions coming together. We partner with uh, not only other technology providers, renewable technology providers, but also hydrogen technology providers, 
in, in, in an effort to bring together to a solution that meets the needs of the customer, be it utilities, munis, co-ops, or in the case of the stock today, corporate energy buyers. Uh, so, how, how, how are these buyers planning to achieve their target to emission, uh, scope to emission reductions? Uh, there are a number of different uh, emission sources, obviously, for, for a lot of these players, but uh, most tar aggressive targets are usually geared towards target uh, scope to reductions in the 2020 time frame, 20, 2020s time frame, or some into 2030s. Uh, they, they've already targeted achieving, matching 100% of their load with carbon-free energy on, on a annual or longer time frame basis. So essentially buying enough renewable power to match their load when it comes to uh, measuring that load over a period of a year and then measuring their renewable production, their renewable purchases that make, they make over the same period of a year. Uh, but those targets are starting to get more granular, understanding that uh, the loads are around the clock. A renewable production needs to be around the clock to really call that 100% clean. So people have started to realize that just buying the same number of megawatt hours as your total consumption, that's good to begin with, but it doesn't quite get you there. It doesn't get you to the ultimate emission reduction target that you need unless it's, it's matched with your load on a temporal basis and on a geographic basis. And the move towards making that geography specific has uh, preceded. So we've already, we're already seeing that to, to reduce their emissions, they're procuring energies, energy in the, in the regions that their loads are, at least in the same grid region, if, in, if not exactly in the exact location. Uh, but then the, the far stretch in the game is how to make it temporally match how to procure energy at the same time that you're using it, be it at night when the sun's not shining or some other time when the wind is not blowing, uh, you still want to meet your load. And if you continue doing that by means of the brown grid power, then you are just limited around how, how, how far you can get. Uh, so that, that shift towards making this load match granular is already being seen in the market. Uh, and of course, as our friend and a few of our friends yesterday mentioned, uh, we also are seeing uh, diesel backups being reconsidered. Uh, how can we make our emergency diesel backup cleaner? How can we make our backup in general cleaner? Uh, so these two trends together, I think, are, are some of the uh, focus that we're seeing in that, in that segment of the market, uh, we, we do have a view as a company around how to get there. And uh, it's not necessarily a short-term view. We, we, we do see some of this unfolding only over the next few years, and maybe, maybe not next two years. Uh, but we, what we do believe is uh, part of the solution has to be combining different generation sources. And this topic has been studied, has been worked on for a long time, uh, but we, what we're ultimately seeing is as long as you can combine your solar or wind generation with another source of generation, you'll, you'll struggle behind, be, beyond a certain percentage of load matching. Uh, if you want it to stay economical, we want to combine different sources of renewable generation. We want to assign two different PPAs within the same grid region, hopefully, that can bring us solar and wind or solar and hydro, or in some cases you want to meet your base load with some hopefully clean PPA. Uh, you're going to have energy storage. Beyond a certain point, you can't just get there with renewables only. You want to have some energy storage that lets you uh, move the power around the clock, basically, and uh, allows you to uh, reach the high levels of penetration. Then, for all this to be to stay economic, you have to smartly structure the thing, and that's where it's you have to be very creative. You have to start thinking about how all these bits and pieces can bring you value, and how can you best monetize 
potentially different value streams that comes out of your storage, that comes out of your renewable generation, or if you, if you select to go with uh, hydrogen, how do you structure the whole thing such that not only the hydrogen is helping you meet your load and get from 80% to 90%, but you, you use the same technology to offer other good services to bring additional value that makes the whole thing economic, to meet ancillary services potentially with your uh, hydrogen generation or energy storage, any type of energy storage that you bring to the mix. So these three, we kind of see them as key enablers for the whole thing. If you want to get beyond 50%, beyond 60%. Uh, and as a company, we've, we've been exploring all these pathways. We have already marched some of this way. And uh, we do have projects, concepts, working with our partners to, to, to take us to the next level from 30 to 40 to 50% penetration. Uh, we also put a lot of effort into modeling these things, essentially, into finding what are the structures that can get us further and further. This structure seen here is one snapshot of this modeling effort where each dot in this chart is a single scenario or a single configuration, if you will, that a certain customer has been able to, is potentially able to procure. So they, can, they, they know that they can procure such up to such amount of solar and wind and potentially storage in a certain region. So what are all the different ways that, can, that we can put them together, different sizes of them, different configurations, different projects that are available in that region, for them to get to a higher levels of carbon-free energy? And then you're also keeping an eye on how, that, how much that costs them uh, on the LCOE chart. So what we can very much see that there's, there, is, there are different ways of getting to a certain degree of penetration or carbon-free energy. There are potentially tens and hundreds of types of procurement that can get you there, but which one is the most economical for you? That's, that's when we start to focus on the leading front of this chart. So it's keep out all the costly dots, get to the cheapest way of getting to that carbon-free energy at each of these percentages. And then you have this line where it's flat for most of it. Starting at 0%, you can sign a solar or wind PPA, get power for 20 years at a fixed price, and that can give you 30 40%. Now you start buying more and more, it takes you to 60%, and then it kind of starts to take off because essentially the profile is exceeding your load and you have to think about what are the risks that are associated with that excess generation while at other hours you still have some deficit. So where you start the uptick is where your deficit and excess mismatch starts to manifest itself. And then there's a certain point where even by combining different generation resources, your solutions start to get more costly than if you add any type of energy storage. So energy storage comes to the mix at somewhere around 75%. Beyond 75%, your cheapest solution of getting to that percentage of carbon-free energy is by bringing in a type of energy storage. And that's all based on the technologies and the prices that are available today in the market. Uh, but what if you want to go one step further? beyond 90%. That's where your uh, traditional or conventional, as if you will, energy storage, lithium ion, starts to uh, not give you the most economical solution. So beyond 90%, that's only when you start to see potentially hydrogen playing a role in moving that last 10% and, and getting you carbon-free energy that's, that's clean uh, more than 90% of the hours of the year. So we're seeing that there is, there is a, a exponential growth in that cost. And that growth wouldn't be there if your targets were only annual. So what you're seeing here is that red line there is, what if you just wanted to match your load annually and not care about the hours? And we know there are some issues with that. We know that 
that doesn't give you full decarbonization if you view it from the broader grid because someone has to meet your load at night and that generation is likely going to be an emitting generation, but that comes to you at a much lower price today. So the cost premium is something that we are predicting is going to go down over the course of the next few years, but the gap is there today. Uh, We take the same chart, we focus on one of those 95% scenarios. So what, what, what does it cost this customer to get to 95% matching of their load on an hourly basis with generation? And we already mentioned that does require them to loop in some kind of long duration energy storage, in this case hydrogen. They also <coughs> Yeah, it, so this structure is enabling them. This is a PV project, this is a wind project that we know is commercially viable for them. And then energy storage, add energy storage to the mix, add hydrogen to the mix. Between all the scenarios that give the 95%, we focus on one that is the most optimally priced. And that's about 220 megawatts of PV, 225 megawatts of wind PPAs, 50 megawatt, four hours energy storage not so big, we can, we can live with 50, 50 megawatts only. Compare that with the, with the size of PV and wind, it, it does come, on, come at a reasonable size. And then you also need electrolyzers if you want to stay economical. You need fuel cell, you need to uh, get fuel cell to get you from 90 to 95 percent. But we also recommend adding electrolyzer now that you're adding fuel cell. There is, there is a benefit in adding that to the system if you consider the PTC that comes with the electrolyzer and the excess generation that's coming from your PV and wind because someone has to take that excess generation. It, it either needs to flow to the grid, but if you're not monetized for that, if for hours that your generation is above the load, you're not monetized for, for excess generation, then you want to think about how do, you, how do you most reliably monetize that. Electrolyzer actually turns out to, to be a good way of monetizing it above your load limit. So you, you, you produce hydrogen. Now you have some green hydrogen. You get the incentives for green hydrogen. How, what's the capacity factor of that electrolyzer? Yes, it needs to be above 50, 60, 70 percent potentially to make the whole thing work. But uh, in this case, it is. So we're seeing that there's a structure that actually combines all these. Uh, Resources is getting us to 95%. At what, at what cost premium? There is a cost premium, definitely. So it's somewhere between two to three times the price of the, the, the regular PPA as generated normal PPA that get, they can get for a PV or wind. Without any energy storage, without any hydrogen storage or hydrogen production, they can get maybe half of that. But then we're getting, we're getting them from 100% annual match to 100% hour by hour matched by that cost premium, and that cost premium will go down. So I have. Questions for Amir? Nice work, Amir. Thank you. Ah, yes, Mike. Thank you for your talk. Um, so in this scenario you just mentioned, is are, are customers mostly interested in grid-connected um, analytics for renewable energy systems like this where, where they use the grid as a backup or, or they're matching uh, yeah. carbon-free? True. Uh, we, as, you, as, you, as you probably noticed, we're not concerned about the remaining 5, 10, 15 percent. So, this is not exactly a microgrid. We're assuming we have a, the grid as a backup to get the rest of it. Uh, if we want to go completely off grid, uh, theoretically it's doable. And I think we have one example before us. But even on fully carbon-free green hydrogen, it's still doable if you have if you if you figure out the logistics of that hydrogen supply. Uh, and we know there are projects that are already working on this concept.
while we're getting the slides up, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Alan Mantooth. Uh, Dr. Mantooth is an uh, electrical engineering faculty member at the University of Arkansas Fayetteville. Uh, Dr. Mantooth holds the 21st Century Research Leadership Chair in Engineering. Uh, he's a past president of the IEEE Power Electronics Society and is the current editor-in-chief of the IEEE Open Journal of Power Electronics. Uh, and Dr. Mantooth is a fellow of IEEE, uh, among some other uh, distinguished uh, society memberships. Uh, his research interests are, uh, include analog and mixed signal IC design, uh, semiconductor device modeling, power electronics, power electronics packaging, and cybersecurity. So we're very thankful to have you today, Alan. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, well, so after those talks uh, and the ones yesterday, I think mine is going to be a bit of a shift in gears, but it'll be a little bit more uh, uh, focused on some of the, the sort of enabling technologies that make these microgrids possible. And, and yet I think the, the, the ball's been teed up nicely because I think uh, we've heard in previous talks how hydrogen comes into play, uh, there are both uh, low and relatively higher carbon solutions, but in all of these solutions, power electronics is at the heart of these things, and it's part of what has, that resurgence over the last 15 years is what's made the penetrations of wind and solar and now uh, hydrogen enabled. So um, I'll talk about what, what it is, and, and we'll use a different uh, phrase for power modules in this talk, so this will, this will be a little bit confusing. I'll be overloading that term. I titled this Technologies and Systems because uh, I think we're going to go, we're going to progress through this. I want you to kind of get a feel for, for where we've come and, and sort of what it is that leads to this. So what is, who is this guy that's talking to us right now? Well, this is not my headstone up here. Um, at Arkansas, when you graduate, they do put your name in senior walk. So everybody's, gra every graduate is in the, is in the sidewalk. So uh, I am a graduate from the University of Arkansas, but I've also been, heavily involved in, in startup companies. Um, I started my career at a startup in the 90s in Oregon, which was acquired by Synopsys, and then uh, have started four companies uh, while at the university. And uh, I think what you see is uh, you know, a spectrum of, of developments that have all played a role in one form or another in the electrical energy sector. And uh, the, the, the most recent of which is a cybersecurity company. So, um, so what I'm going to do is just kind of briefly introduce this uh, this power group, but it's representative of the kinds of things that are happening in this field. And then I'll talk about some of the driving factors uh, in in power electronics uh, as it pertains to microgrids and so forth. Um, what are some of those emerging needs, and then some examples of where these things have come and where the sort of edge of, of things are. And of course, I always have to acknowledge sponsors, so thank you for the logos and the money as well. Um, so um, the, the, uh, the, the UA Power Group is an umbrella organization that I direct that involves uh, 16 faculty members, about 110 graduate students, and is one of the largest power electronics groups in, in the world, really, but certainly in America. Um, it involves three core facilities, a, a six megawatt test facility, which is a microgrid in of itself. So it's where we evaluate new technologies that both we develop as well as the industry. And that's known as NCREPT, or the National Center for Reliable Electric Power Transmission. Um, HIDEC is High Density Electronics Center. That's where we do our advanced packaging. Uh, the Nano Institute is where we develop gallium nitride capabilities. And then later in th this year, and then a uh, the new building in 2024 will be a silicon carbide fab that we're building a six inch fab, so that'll do the, uh, we'll be developing uh, high temperature electronics and, and power electronic uh, devices there. But in addition to those core facilities that we have at the university, there's federally funded uh, centers of excellence in uh, transportation, uh, elect electrified transportation, which is the POET Center, uh, the GRAPE Center, which is grid connected uh, power electronic systems, um, and then SEEDS, which is our cybersecurity center. And SITE's also another cyber center that's sort of taking over for the sunsetting of, of the first one. So these are centers of excellence that, that involve many universities uh, in a collaborative arrangement in, in each case, um, depending. And, and I won't have time to go through those details, but it is a very full-fledged. And so I put this slide up here so you can see how vertically integrated the activity is. It sort of represents anywhere from materials and devices all the way through the systems that you 
you saw uh, in, in David's talk where you're talking about you know fuel cells and then the married power electronics that, that interface those to the to the grid or to the loads whatever the case may be so we work on both the the supply side as well as the load side power electronics here and so uh, I, and like I say when we start talking about uh, integrating those into the actual systems such as microgrids then then we start looking at the specifics of the types of converters that are best and the control systems and a big part of this is the controls so this is just a slide on the test facility that we opened and this is a very active uh, beehive of activity for uh, a large array of, of power electronic projects ranging from heavy equipment to to the grid itself and then the music facility as I said is something that uh, is a very big deal for us so I wanted to spend just a, a minute um, Mahindra had asked me to say something about this. This is kind of a unique capability for the nation. Uh, the National Science Foundation funded this last year, um, and basically it's a mid-scale research infrastructure grant, pays for all the equipment. The university's paying for the building. But it'll be a national facility, only one of its kind, uh, really in the world, but certainly it's unique to the, to the U.S., where people can submit designs to this, and we will fabricate those designs. And so particularly for low-volume prototyping, it builds a bridge in the manufacturing chain for the U.S. between traditional university research, which would be an investigator or two in their own laboratory. Uh, this is more of a, 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 a pure fab line for low volume prototyping and a bridge to the high volume manufacturers such as XFAB and, and Lubbock, Wolf Speed, and others that build silicon carbide at scale. But they don't really have the interest in doing low volume things because they're geared up for all this electrification that's happening in cars and trucks and so forth so they're all focused on product so that's that's something that I think is a, a, a national effort so to the heart of the talk now so you know when we think about the different ages of mankind certainly we're we're, we're living in a semiconductor age now um, when you look at, all, at around you I mean the, the pandemic really uh, you know, sort of accelerated the, the thought that if we don't have chips, then we don't have uh, a lot of things we, we care about. And uh, car lots go empty and, and other sorts of things. So, and we also uncovered some vulnerabilities in our uh, uh, antiquated just-in-time uh, supply chain thinking uh, for you industrial engineers in the audience. Um, so, uh, so anyway, I, I think, I think uh, in, in this regard, we've, we've, uh, we've sort of come full circle and in, in resurging the manufacturing that we need in America. So, and thus the, the fab that you saw before, just another link in that chain. Um, so when you look around though, um, one of the things you'll find is that uh, power electronics are actually everywhere. Look around the room. Everything that is operating has got power electronics in it. You touch it no less than five times before you get in your car. Then you touch it a lot more, <laughs> okay? And so, so it, it's, it's milliwatt power electronics to megawatt. So power electronics is power management in all of its forms, shaping it, conditioning it, and trying to do it as efficiently and making the best use of those electrons in every way we can. And so when you think about that, what is, what's driving the, the latest trends? Well, moving people and goods. That's been the big driver. And when you saw those charts yesterday of where greenhouse gas emissions come from, you know, transportation that's a biggie okay and so obviously people have gone after that in a major way um, but it's not the only thing okay so when you start thinking about uh, we, we talked a little bit about industrial electrification yesterday ah, perfect um, residential of course and then of course the commercial sector started adopting pretty early on particularly organizations like Walmart with with renewable energies on on roofs a lot of people don't realize how much solar those guys have bought but when you're that big, you know, making one decision is billions of dollars of impact. So this, these are some of the drivers, but what about things like Internet of Things? Not what we think about when we think about power electronics, but we have to. Um, of course, the, the buildings, the data centers that were pointed out earlier, medical. Um, and yes, now we start talking about microgrids in a simple equation. Here I am an engineer, I had to put one equation, right? Um, <laughs> But I made it an easy one, okay? Distributed energy resources, okay? Plus storage, plus controls, okay? And all of that in a microgrid setting that's matched to the 
to the, the task. Okay, it's a microgrid, so it's going to be somewhat task oriented. The loads with, that it will serve, the, the, the source of energy, those will sort of be matched and designed, and that's the, the business that these gentlemen are in, is, is, is coming up with that design that works for that scenario. That's why it's not just a cookie cutter every time they go out. Okay, there is some degree of customization that makes it, you know, the most efficient, the most appropriate. Okay, so when we think about microgrids, there's a number of technologies that contribute to that. We've talked about the, 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 the sources a little bit with the, with the fuel cells, um, renewable energy, that sort of thing. When we start thinking about the technology wheel that sort of puts all this, to, brings all this together in microgrids, it goes from devices, circuits, the, the tools that we use to build them, the, the electronic packaging, those are the power modules in my world, um, and then our power electronics controls, and ultimately, yes, even cybersecurity and physical security, because as we've seen, that can become a major problem if we don't address it from the design up. And so this is things that we research, and these are the things that have sort of led to the, the developments that you've now seen in renewable energy sector um, and, and, and the transformations. Silicon, you know, is king. Silicon is cheap, it is plentiful, it, we make it, it's very pure, it's great, it's wonderful, but it has limitations. And in niche applications, and power being one of them, uh, other, other technologies can come in and, and, and assist in a great way. One of those areas is, uh, one of those materials is silicon carbide, another is gallium nitride. These wideband gap materials, as they're called, allow us to design and build circuits that can operate at higher voltages. And you think, well, you know, why do I care about this? Well, I can put a megawatt of power processing in the palm of my hand now, whereas 20 years ago, I couldn't. And with silicon, I never will be able to. And if you think size doesn't matter when it comes even to the power grid, it does matter. Because your, your cost of installation could be one guy and a screwdriver rather than three guys picking up this aluminum heat sink to cool the, the silicon electronics, okay? So it does make a big difference in terms of, of uh, how you deploy things. So all these things lead to power density, extreme environment um, reliability and ruggedness. And so uh, as a result, they can, we can start building power electronics, as I asked earlier, that will last more than 10 to 12 years in the field, but maybe 25 years in the field. That's where we're trying to go. And, we, and what's the end result? What you've seen in consumer electronics all of your lives, as time goes by, those electronics get cheaper and cheaper. How much is a television now? You know, I mean, the, the, I bought a 75 inch big screen TV just to, to display artwork for 600 bucks. Okay, I mean, are you kidding me? <laughs> and, it, when we, and it was 2,500 bucks just what, 10 years ago? That's what I'm talking about. That's what electronics does. It goes down in price as you add performance and you add scale. This is what we want to see with power electronics. It just keeps going down, down, down. You can buy a generator now, or a, 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 not a diesel generator, a, a motor drive for roughly um, 10 cents a watt, where it was a dollar a watt just 10 years ago. That's an order of magnitude reduction in the power electronics that drive that. So, so this is what we expect from electronics, and we hope to continue to expect it from electronics as it goes down in price as we, as we start increasing the integration level and the volume. And so integration is a big part of it. You think about integrated circuits. Why do I care about this in a, in a talk like this? Well, it's just, what? it's those chips again. Here they come. It's all digital control, okay? It's all, it's all but we need chips that can, that can withstand the ruggedness of what we're dealing with in a, in a power sector. And so these are just a snapshots of circuits that we've built, just as an example. And we've inserted these look, operational to over 400C. So if you've got high temperature situations, well, this is an example. And in fact, we took those circuits, packaged them in our facility, put them inside the Aerodyne uh, spin test at 14,000 Gs. Why? Because they're sensor electronics in a natural gas turbine, okay? And so there's a, a sensor on the blades. These electronics are in the base of the blade, and they don't have to guess when it's time for maintenance which is a million dollars a day when they take down the natural gas turbine and lost revenue, okay? So they wanna know that they have a problem and they wanna take it down. 
So they have health monitoring circuitry that can live at 500 degrees C and survive that, that, those types of G-forces. That's what you can do with electronics that you can't do with silicon. Silicon never lived there. At about 150 C, it's, it's toast, okay? This is still, in fact, this one operates even better at 225 than it does room temperature. And as it gets to 500, still operating. These are the kinds of circuits that we can put in companionship with a lot of the technologies you're talking about that happen to be higher temperature, okay? So we're pushing the boundaries to get this to 800 C for these, for these electronics. So it does make a difference. And now we shrink the size, weight, and volume, and you've got something very rugged that can withstand all of this. So you can see this is, this is real, this is happening. This was demonstrated inside a Siemens gas turbine, okay? So further, we've taken that type of technology, that little chip, integrated inside the module, and eliminated all the boards right here. So you, you end up eliminating PC boards. Everything gets more and more tightly integrated. You've seen this in your lifetime as things have become more and more tightly integrated. You have a, a DSP chip inside your, your audio receiver and you got all these different, you know, sort of uh, possible sounds that the thing can produce, whether you're in a studio or you're in a, in a, in a concert hall, all on one chip, okay? So this, these kinds of effects, all right there. And so this is where we're going with the power electronics as well. And uh, the, the, the curve there was just demonstrating some reliability uh, aspects of it. So the key to all this, integration, integration, integration. Heterogeneous integration that we're bringing things together that haven't normally been integrated together, putting them into a single package and making them very power dense. Managing the thermal, managing the shock and vibration, managing all the things necessary to make them rugged. Okay. So it requires a lot of developments. I won't go through this list, but it requires a lot of developments in, in, in different technologies, including design tools. So this is a hardware software problem for, you know, this is our next generation of students are learning this craft, this sort of multi-objective optimization of all of these heterogeneous parts put into a single system. This is what we're teaching them so they can, so they can do this work. So this is an example of that. This is that megawatt in the palm of your hand right here. 1.7 kilovolt power module, literally about the size of my hand, given my fingers are kind of long, but okay. So, um, but 1.6 kiloamps flowing through that. It has all of these smart electronics built into it. Okay, so it has all the, the driving capability, the health monitoring capability, all inside that one package that's roughly this large. Now you take three of those and I can drive a megawatt motor. Just three. Okay, three little blades driving this megawatt motor. Of course, that might be attractive if I'm trying to go all electric aircraft. And so that's the kinds of things that you could do something here. Or, you know, believe it or not, for the last 10 to 12 years, Caterpillar and John Deere have been hybrid electric. So this is the kind of module they want for their big bulldozers, okay? So it saves them about 25% in fuel costs. And the operators don't get the jerkiness of hydraulics use electric motors and you've all driven an electric vehicle at some point I hope you know how much torque that thing has at zero speed when you punch it it snaps your head back okay this this is the kind of power that a bulldozer operator wants at low speed to be able to move things it's a natural fit so these are different uh, power modules that we've developed through the years over probably maybe the last five or six years for various applications from 650 volts up to 10 kV and beyond now. Okay, and so as an, as an example, when you think about microgrids, this is the DNA right here. These modules, these power modules are the power handling packages that handle the power that's flowing into and out of the fuel cells, to the loads, all that. I'll show you a diagram in a moment of all the different places where this fits. And at various voltage levels, depending on if we're talking about uh, connected to the medium voltage grid or connected to residential. So this is an example of where we've taken that technology and put it into a Toyota Prius. Now this was done, uh, we actually, this, there is a tie into Kentucky here actually, because this car came from Georgetown. Okay, they drove it down. Okay, it was a, a, a plug-in hybrid version. Okay, this is 10 years old now. 
okay? 10 years. They drove this down to our facility. We re-engineered the controls, the battery management controls, and this is the charging electronics for the plug-in version. 6.6 .6 kilowatt bi-directional charger where the one they had at that point was a, about the size of a big pizza box and it was one and a half kilowatts and it required water cooling because it was silicon. It got too warm. So it has separate cooling loop just for the electronics. This is 98.5% efficient and just doesn't generate any heat. And it can fit in the glove box. It's about that big. That's, what the, that's going from silicon to silicon carbide technology. Things got smaller, got more efficient, no thermal management required, and they can locate it in a lot of different places within the, within the car. So we actually installed it in the car and they drove it back up here to Georgetown. And that's when they had the, the big splash about it, okay? So that was our, our tie in there. But, uh, um, so, and, but it's, you know, one of the things I'm gonna talk to you about in the next slide is, is some of the other projects that fit more appropriately into the microgrid. You might say, well, why would I point this one out? Well, and when you think about it, we're dealing with a grid connect, battery management, motor drive, I mean, we've got a lot of things going on in this just little car. So maybe it's a nano grid, but it's still, you know, in principle, handling a lot of the same types of concepts that you would at grid scale. So down into the controls level. So here's a couple of examples. The unit on the left, done by one of our uh, students, is a, is a uh, roughly one megawatt multi-level converter, MMC's uh, modular multi-level converter, okay? And you know, oftentimes when we go from low voltage to high voltage, we have to have a transformer, those big green things. Okay, and the reason they're so big is they're 60 hertz. So they're line frequency. If we do that at a higher frequency, we can make them smaller. Okay, because the magnetics get smaller. Well, we developed one that didn't even need a transformer. Transformerless completely. So I can connect from batteries that are say 480, 500 volt, 600 volt batteries to 13.8 kV by boosting that voltage and connecting it directly to the medium voltage grid. Our big advance in what we patented here actually wasn't the topology because it was known. We developed the fault diagnosis and the fault um, and the rerouting capability, essentially self-healing capability. So we developed a new modular circuit that once a fault was detected, we could route around it. And so we built resiliency into this. This is what you want in the microgrid and reliability. You talked about redundancy. What about if each converter you bought had the redundancy already built in and had the software monitoring to ascertain when something was going out of spec and then just rerouted? And then you got a flag that says, uh, we've had to reroute. You know, we've had to, we've had to utilize our redundancy. This is where things are going. This is what's driving the power electronics to drive the reliability up. And then the one on the right is one that we received a patent for, and it mostly was for the, the energy management system. It's a power router for the home. Okay, so essentially this is a unit you hang on your wall behind your, behind your meter and in front of your breaker box. And it's, it is the solar inverter, so plug your solar panels into it. It does manage the batteries that you plug into it. it ha you can put a backup generator on it, okay? and it just manages energy into and out of the home. It's, it's grid connected, but has an automatic transfer switch, so if the grid goes down, it'll island the house, okay? It takes time of use pricing and weather data. Weather data is for forecasting, okay? So you can manage your energy storage. The time of use pricing is so that the utility can send a pricing signal and load shed an entire neighborhood. If they're about to have brownouts, they don't have to ask for your permission if you've given it already. You give the permission through this. They send a high signal, a high pricing signal, and this unit says, ooh, that's too expensive. Let's use our backup generation, okay? Or let's use our battery storage, or let's use the solar. And so in this, in this case, we can go off grid, and the utility can control that with one pricing signal, okay? So as a result, and, the, and, the, and the, the figure at the bottom is that you can control it from your iPhone or your, or your Android device. So you can log into it and say, I'm going to be away for three days on vacation. So I can, it will manage, it'll have a profile for your, your energy usage while you're away. So it knows the difference between Monday through Friday and Saturday and Sunday. It, it learns your habits as it goes. So this is a type of, of intelligence that's built into the power electronics. 
So those learning algorithms, some people call it artificial intelligence. <laughs> it's just a learning algorithm. It's just basically <coughs> learning the behavior and utilizing that history to help predict how you're going to use energy tomorrow. And so it can have the energy storage prepped and ready. If a storm is on the way, that's why we have the weather, the weather data. If a storm is on the way, it's going, to, it's going to bring that storage up so you have more standby time if something goes down. So it also utilizes things like uh, uh, algorithms for utilizing your um, hot water heater for energy storage. So it will increase the temperature of your hot water just a bit and utilize that as an energy storage mechanism. So these are all uh, technologies built into this unit. So that's something that we actually researched that over about 10 years. That was, a, that was not a simple, simple thing. Okay, so we worked with a lot of companies, uh, GE, appliances, and different people actually looking at this kind of energy management. Okay, so as you look at those types of, of, of ideas, that's, that's the kind of technology that goes into a microgrid controller. I, there were a couple of diagrams people showed that had a microgrid controller. It's that kind of technology that's the brains behind how to use the energy into and out of a microgrid. And so these are just examples of, of other, you know, drives and, and, and converters we've built that have that kind of uh, intelligence built into them for different scenarios, whether it's heavy equipment, whether it's, you know, charging electronics, whether it's um, power conditioning, you know, like you'd find in a, in a microgrid often, um, all of these. And so uh, when I look at this, this was the chart I was referring to, is, is a Love's truck stop really going to become a, a, a little microgrid? It may. Depending on how much we hybridize these, this, these trucks and, and these cars, um, think about it. Is it at, at right now, many, many of our utility friends are saying they're going to become a substation. Because if they're really going to have that much power needed to charge uh, cars, they're going to have to upgrade. Because those, those little electric feeds that they've got now are not going to do it. Okay, and so more microgrid assets will be, you know, this will be a rich uh, opportunity, I think, for placing some of those, uh, you know, hydrogen fuel cell based solutions, whether hydrogen is the fuel or hydrogen is used as in the different ways we've talked about for, for generating electricity, whatever the case may be on site, this may be what we're looking at. And you can see my white boxes here. These are the parts I love. They're not very animated, but it's those converters. <laughs> And when you look at that, you think, oh, gosh, there must be a better way because I'm converting from PV to a medium voltage bus. And from that medium voltage bus, then I have to convert again to use it. So these are things we're looking at, architectures, how we can, because if you can reduce the number of times you go through one of those boxes, you improve efficiency. Each one of those converters is probably about 99% efficient now. That's, they're, really, they're really highly efficient, but still, a little bit of loss there. Okay, and we're trying to eliminate that as much as possible. Okay, so this is an example of, of sort of what I would call a DC microgrid where everything's centered around a DC bus. This medium voltage bus might be a 15 kV bus, uh, up to 30 kV. And we, the reason we want it at a high voltage is very simple. Put the, the cables are smaller. We don't want to haul a cable around this big to, to deliver the power. Higher voltage, lower current, simple cables, Mere humans can handle them. <laughs> so, you know, that's why. So you don't need to be afraid of the high voltage as much as, as you know, the, the safety is involved in, in, in handling the power. And one of those is having things that are, that are tractable. So one, one slide on cybersecurity, and I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, one of the things that we've looked at for the last, probably since 2015, very earnestly, is building in cybersecurity by design. If we don't, if we try to shoehorn it in at the end, it's, we're sort of chasing our tail. And, and so we've developed some, some uh, architectures that we're open sourcing that people can take and then tailor to their own needs, whereby they can, they can say for $25, a, a $10,000 solar inverter can be approved for $25 uh, in extra hardware, and it is much more cyber hardened. If they do crack into it, there's fail-safes. And if they crack those, there's further fail-safes. Because it's built into the hardware, it's not just a software problem. So you can cyber-secure these things with, 
redundant hardware. And that's what you basically see here is digital signal processor one, digital signal processor two. A little bit of hardware redundancy can go a long way to preventing an attacker from being successful because you can use one to be monitoring what the other one is doing and if somebody gets in you know it right away and you can work around it and you can always lock them out and back up to a previous well-known state very easily and in nanoseconds you can do this so it's very rapid so they just they can't defeat it someone sitting at a keyboard just can't type fast enough okay so that's that when you design it in like that then you have a cyber secure system and we need those so in the, in the interest of, of uh, both pride and, um, and um, uh, microgrid, nanogrid type of, uh, I talked about the Prius being sort of a nanogrid. On February 20th, we actually flew this aircraft that you see here. That's a GoPro on the underside of the wing that is a hybrid electric aircraft. It is being retrofitted. It's a twin engine, front back engine, and the back engine in this one is electric and it's flying under all electric power, okay? This is actually a company in Los Angeles, Amp Air, that is, their business is retrofitting these for a lot of um, island and archipelago type of uh, situations where they, they're sort of air taxis. They fly 20 to 30 minutes and move people around. And so uh, it turns out there's a lot of these things out there. They have an order for 150 of these things right now just to, just to convert them to hybrid but they, they almost eliminate fuel cost. The only time they really use the gas is when they're cruising and they're recharging the batteries. Because, and then the gas engine is operating very efficiently. Whereas during taxi, all electric. Take off, all electric. Then they cruise and then they land. So pretty, pretty interesting scenario. The uh, motor drive is one of the ones that we built. So this was done under RPE funding and it, the biggest part of this is all the controls with the pilot, okay? And you, you're managing energy into and out of a battery system, okay? You're replenishing that charge. So this is, this is, this is the kind of uh, sort of nano grid thing that we've done. So let me summarize with this. You know, power electronics is rapidly becoming the heart of many of these systems, and we don't want it to be the weak link. So we're working hard to reduce cost and increase reliability of these systems. Uh, and you know, if uh, we look at what are the keys to that, this heterogeneous integration that I know many of you might have glossed over because, oh, I don't do that sort of thing. This, is, this, these, this heterogeneous integration is the key. How do we bring these things together, these disparate technologies, and how do we get them to work together? How do we make them equally rugged? And how do we protect them cyber-wise? Okay. It's those things that, that make the difference, and that will be what you will see in the end is power electronics that last longer, perform better, okay? Um, certainly microgrids benefit from this efficiency we're talking about and this power density, okay? And then ultimately the controls that we develop, um, such as controls for health monitoring and others that I, that I mentioned. So, and I'll just leave it with my own personal statement. I've been doing this for a while now. Battery electrification is, uh, is great, but it's not it can't be our full future. It's just not sustainable. It's just not sustainable. Um, so it's a bridge to a hydrogen future or some other type of future, but, but battery electrification, it's gonna be great for 20 years, okay? But our entire fleet of vehicles is not going to be battery electric. It's just, the numbers just aren't there. Not with the current battery technology and with the materials they're made out of. So let's, uh, we have to keep moving fast on this hydrogen work. This, this is a big deal for, for the world. So I'm all in. All right, thank you. Questions for Alan. Thank you so much for a very nice talk. I have a question regarding the uh, white band gap materials, gallium nitride and silicon nitride. Uh, of course, uh, I, I work in gallium nitride for a long time, and I'm from Poland, from a group, uh, from a couple of groups which uh, develop a single, uh, sig mono, I mean, single crystal gallium nitride technology. Um, one was at the High Pressure uh, Institute uh, at Warsaw, another one was Amano technology. Mm -hmm. 
So my question is, um, is there, I mean, how large advantages are of using single crystals in this uh, power electronics? Because the, the uh, growing uh, polycrystalline films is much, much easier <laughs> than, than having a large single crystal. So is it worth pursuing this, this very difficult technology or is a single, I mean, polycrystalline technology enough to, to, to uh, develop uh, devices for the current and maybe one or two decade uh, in the future needs? Yeah, good question. So uh, the, the single crystal stuff is important because we need, we need the level of purity and, uh, that, that it offers. But, but polycrystalline is, 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 plays an equally important role. So it's, it depends on which aspect of the, the semiconductor we're talking about. But when we're talking about the fundamental transistors and the power handling, the single crystal is the best. It gives us the best thermal management. It gives us the best uh, mobility um, for, for the uh, transistors, so which, which translates to current handling capability um, and uh, ultimately longevity. So, um, and so the header structures that they're building today in gallium nitride-based systems are they have the most promise actually of all semiconductors. That's, that's the ones that, that may end up taking over. Silicon carbide is, 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 is sort of the, in the lead now and maybe for the next 10 years for these high voltage devices, 10 kV up to 20 kV devices. It's just amazing, one chip can block 10 kV. You know, it's, it's, it's quite fascinating. But that's due to the, to the purity and the single crystalline properties, it is. All of Bloom Energy. Um, you mentioned uh, some limitations within power electronics um, that could lead to limitations with deploying microgrids. So mm -hmm. a perfect example of that is today, um, Bloom Energy doesn't install fuel cell systems within a mile of coastal waters uh, because of worry about corrosion with power electronics. So mm -hmm. my question is, is this a common problem? If so are there solutions for it? <laughs> Water always gets in, period. <laughs> <laughs> it just finds a way. We've, this is a materials problem. I'm telling you, we were, we are, this is an active area of investigation, but it has been for 20 years, um, where we're trying to develop dielectric materials where we can keep the humidity out. But at the end of the day, we've begun designing the systems assuming it's going to get in. And that's, that's going to have to be the answer. Because no matter what kind of goop we develop, it always finds a way to get in. Water just finds its way in. And so, so whether it's in a coastal area or not. And so this is part of the thing that destroys solar inverters out in the field, is at the end of the day, after all of the diagnosis, after all the failure analysis has been done, it's humidity and, 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 and water making its way into the electronics in ways that's, it's not, it's not as simple as shorting out something. It's degradation, corrosion, as you say, it's, it's a degradation mechanism, an aging mechanism. And so what we are looking at is how do we develop systems that can, that can you know, be, uh, operate in that type of environment. Um, so there, are, there may be, for example, in metallizations, there are coatings we can put on the metals that would just not corrode in the presence of that or not corrode nearly as quickly, as opposed to taking our copper and our aluminum and just coating it with some dielectric material. And then once it gets in there, it starts corroding Maybe that's also covered with some sort of thin film of titanium that won't that won't rust, you know, or won't won't corrode in the same way. So these are these are approaches that we're looking at, um, and yes, it's um, uh, we feel like that that uh, progress is certainly being made in that in that in that way, and people continue to look at the material solutions as well. Okay, big hand for Alan. All right. What time we got, Mike? Uh, we are right on time. It's ten thirty. Okay, uh, we're gonna take a break. Joe. Oh, Joe. Is there a break between Joe's talk? I don't think there was on the. Oh. Yeah. Okay. No breaks this morning. Okay. Is that about the time? Probably.
Absolutely so. All right, well, hope everybody's staying awake, you know. I think we've got some coffee out there. If there's a need for, need for a little refresher. Um, I, I, I certainly thought today's talks were gonna be, you know, quite, quite varied in nature because as we think about microgrids, connection of, of the hydrogen-based systems, whether it's fuel cells or electrolyzers to uh, the power grid, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, different variety, a lot of different uh, variation a lot of different technology pieces coming together. As somebody who teaches classes on power electronics, you know, this use of enabling technology is something I talk a lot about in my classes, and I certainly uh, saw that in, in uh, Professor Mantu's talk. So now we have uh, Mr. Joe Estrada from uh, EPRI. Uh, Joe is a uh, principal technical leader uh, with the Electric Power Research Institute. Uh, under his current role, Joe works with the hydrogen, uh, on hydrogen and other uh, low carbon technologies uh, and supports uh, EPRI's uh, LCRI, the Low Carbon Research Inici Initiative. So thank you, Joe, for coming to talk today. Thank you. Uh, well, Appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, um, just a little bit about what I'm going to cover today. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about uh, microgrids. I'm going to start off pretty basic, um, talk about um, uh, hydrogen's role within, uh, within microgrids. Um, Go through uh, the different components of, uh, of um, designing a microgrid, and um, uh, finish off with some considerations in, um, in sizing of the equipment of a microgrid. And then finally, go through a couple of um, examples of some microgrids that we have uh, domestically installed, and uh, hopefully keep it under a half hour. Uh, so, um, a little bit about uh, about EPRI. So, we we're founded in 1972 um, in response to the uh, to the uh, great blackout in the early 70s. Uh, government realized that uh, there needed to be an independent uh, body uh, doing research in, uh, in energy and power generation for the, uh, the, for the advancement of, uh, of innovation and technology. Mm -hmm. So um, we're the world's uh, permanent, independent, nonprofit uh, energy research and development organization. We have offices all over the world. Um, we work with uh, 450 companies across 45 countries. Uh, driving innovation to ensure the public has clean, safe, reliable, and affordable um, and equitable access to electricity across the globe. So as I mentioned, you know, we're, we're a nonprofit. Uh, we're chartered to serve the public benefit with guidance from an independent uh, advisory council. Uh, we systematically and imaginatively look ahead to identify issues, technology gaps, uh, and broader needs that can be addressed by the, electric, the electricity sector. Um, we're objective, um, we're scientific research, uh, our scientific research leading uh, to progress in reliability, efficiency, affordability, health, safety of the environment. Um, we are also very collaborative. We bring together our members in diverse scientific and technical sectors to shape and drive research and development in the electricity sector. So, start getting into uh, a little bit of the, uh, the basics. Um, We'll start with you know our grid today, um, and I guess our what we refer to as our traditional grid, where we have centralized power. Um, you know, this is uh, uh, represented here as a as a power plant centrally located. These power plants can generate hundreds, if not gigawatts, of uh, of energy. Uh, they distribute uh, energy um, in a wide area uh, uh, grid. Um, here it's represented. You know, I've got some uh, residential, some commercial, and then you'll see that I've got some small scale distributed energy resources that have, you know, we slowly start to see pop up um, throughout the uh, the grid um, by way of, you know, solar PV or wind or uh, what have you, CHP plants. Um, uh, what's a microgrid? Microgrid is a self-sufficient energy system that serves a discrete geographic footprint, such as a school campus, a commercial complex, or a residential community. Um, three key aspects to a uh, to a microgrid: um, it must be uh, it's it's local, right? So um, it creates energy for its nearby customers. It, um, this distinguishes the microgrid from the wide area grid, in that um, uh, those wide those the centralized grid will provide most of the electricity. Um, that's provided most of the uh, uh, most of the electricity in the last uh, in the last century. Um, a central grid will push electricity to, um, from power plants over long distances via transmission lines, and um, you know we suffer uh, transmission uh, line loss as well. So there's some inefficiencies with the uh, wide area grid. 
that you know um, is a benefit for a microgrid where um, you know because you're delivering energy to a, uh, on, a on a short distance you don't um, you don't see those uh, those power losses. Um, it has the ability to be independent, so uh, microgrid can connect from a wide area uh, grid um, on a as needed basis and island itself from the uh, from the grid. Um, this island the islanding gives the capability. Uh, to supply power to its customers whenever there's a disruption to the wide area grid by way of a, sto way of a storm or, or any other type of uh, uh, outage. And um, finally, it has the ability to, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's also intelligent. So, um, you know, as Alan was just talking about, um, you know, microcontrollers, um, it has uh, advanced uh, uh, controller systems that uh, emanate, um, that uh, are really the, cent the, the central brain of the, uh, of, of the system, and it manages the generators, the batteries, and all the loads um, within the energy system with a high degree of sophistication. Um, so it orchestrates uh, multiple resources within the, uh, the grid and, and recognizes when, uh, you know, when power is cheap, when um, it's economically uh, uh, makes sense to, uh, to bring power from the grid uh, due to inexpensive uh, energy uh, prices. and. Um, uh, it disconnects whenever uh, perhaps there isn't uh, uh, cheap power available. Um, whenever cheap power is available, maybe it, uh, it charges the batteries in the microgrids, and then whenever it becomes more expensive, it, um, it, it, uh, the battery discharges to its customers, thereby you know, insulating those customers from, from those high energy prices. So um, going back to the, uh, the diagram that I, uh, that I showed earlier, um, on the left-hand side, uh, you'll see a, uh, um, the power plant and one of the branches um, that, uh, that I, I, I tried to show earlier. Um, on the, on the right-hand side, you see the, uh, the microgrid. Um, in this instance, um, this microgrid has a set of residential homes and a couple of commercial buildings with some EV charging stations. Um, you'll see that um, you know, microgrid has uh, local power generation. This can be a CHP plant, it can be wind, solar, um, it can be anything really, and um, um, uh, is always coupled with, uh, with storage, um, some type of uh, storage. Um, and then very importantly, of course, is the uh, microgrid controller that I'm showing at the very top of the screen there. So why hydrogen? Um, hydrogen provides um, energy resilience, so um, as I was talking earlier, you know, in the event of a natural disaster or disrup disruption, um, it, can, uh, it can island itself from, uh, from, from the wide area grid and, and continually and autonomously provide power to, uh, to its, uh, its demands. Um, it also uh, gives us energy security, so um, it can provide energy security by reducing dependence on imported fossil fuels. Hydrogen can, produce, can be produced locally using renewable resources and uh, thereby reducing the need to import uh, fuels um, and improving local energy security. Um, it offers also environmental sustainability. So um, hydrogen microgrid uh, can, promote, uh, uh, can promote sustainability by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, hydrogen produced by renewable energy resources is a, uh, gives us a clean energy carrier that can be used to power vehicles, buildings, and other um, applications, thereby reducing the, uh, the localized footprint. You know, in the research that I was performing, I also found this cost savings, and I know that this is a, um, you know, we, we, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, and um, I think that, you know, um, this is gonna be especially uh, true once the, uh, the um, hydrogen market re reaches homeostasis, but, um, you know, there is an opportunity there to provide some cost savings uh, by reducing the energy costs and improving energy efficiency. So you're, you know, you're avoiding those line losses and um, that in itself uh, results in, uh, in some cost savings. And by incorporating renewable energy sources and energy storage, the microgrid can reduce the dependence on expensive traditional energy res uh, resources and uh, improve energy efficiency leading to cost savings over time. Once we've been able to develop the, uh, the hydrogen market, um, as we improve our manufacturing processes, we develop a stronger supply chain, um, the cost will come down. Right now, we're not seeing very much cost competitiveness when it comes to hydrogen, but I think you know, that will change. And then finally, um, energy independence. Um, as a hydrogen microgrid can provide energy independence by allowing uh, communities and facilities to generate their own 
um, energy locally. So this can provide greater control over energy production and usage, reducing, independ uh, reducing dependence on centralized energy providers and improving energy dependence. So a little bit about um, hydrogen applications and utilization. Um, I think that we've covered a lot of this over the past uh, day and a half, but um, just as a, uh, as a refresher, you know, hydrogen has a, a, a significant amount of, uh, of applications. Um, On-road transportation, uh, powering light duty and heavy duty, medium uh, duty vehicles. Um, Off-road tra transportation, we've seen a lot of research being done into applications into marine, rail, aviation, construction, agriculture, mining, and manufacturing. Um, within industry, uh, production of uh, primary metals, um, opportunities within petrochemical, cement, glass, and then the food and beverage industry. And then within buildings, uh, space heating, water heating, space cooling, water, uh, water cooling. And then finally, uh, power generation. Uh, we can utilize hydrogen to, uh, to um, uh, feed it into a, uh, into a fuel cell there by providing uh, power to, uh, to a, a load. Um, we can use it for natural gas uh, blending. And um, eventually, you know, there's a lot of work being done into, uh, into developing uh, um, gas turbines that are able to fire 100% uh, uh, hydrogen. So, um, breaking the, uh, the uh, hydro, high microgrid into, uh, into several components, um, being uh, production, storage, delivery, and then finally end use. So, um, going from left to the right, you know, production. Um, for the hydrogen production um, uh, process, you'll need a, uh, a power generator. And ideally, you would want something that has zero uh, carbon emissions if you want a true green grid. Um, com uh, it consists also of an electrolyzer uh, that's being fed by, uh, by a potable water source and being powered by those, uh, those generators. And then finally, a compression system, if you, uh, depending on the type of storage that, uh, that you're going to have. If it's high pressure storage, um, you're going to need some type of compression system. Uh, for the hydrogen storage piece, um, you know, we, can, uh, we, can st we have the ability to uh, uh, store hydrogen using compressed hydrogen gas storage. We can liquefy um, hydrogen, uh, we can chemically store hydrogen, and then we can also store it underground um, in uh, geologic formations. Uh, for delivery, um, hydrogen can be delivered via, uh, via pipeline, uh, compressed gas trucking, compressed liquid trucking. And then if you have on-site production, um, you don't really need to deliver it very far. Uh, you've got your, uh, your loads right nearby. So. And then finally, end use um, recap of, uh, of my previous slide. Um, so several applications there. So let's take a look at a, a simplified uh, flow diagram for a microgrid, looking at those four different components that I just, uh, I just reviewed. So the production piece, see the electrolyzer there in the middle, um, being fed uh, zero carbon energy um, uh, by uh, um, some generation assets, and then the water supply. Um, the electrolyzer will, uh, will split the, uh, the water into uh, hydrogen and oxygen, so you can see the, uh, the oxygen uh, um, you know, uh, being emitted up, up, up the top. That can be you know, captured and reutilized. And then uh, the compressor um, there next to the, uh, to the electrolyzer um, at the outlet. Finally, you're, uh, um, eventually you get to your hydrogen storage, whatever that might be. And then for delivery, I kind of just you know, drew some spaghetti uh, arrows there. Um, but I, um, I, for this example, I used um, a pretty wide variety of, uh, of end users. Um, so I've got, uh, I've got some hydrogen going over to uh, to industry, uh, transportation, residential. I've got a, a hydrogen blending facility there being fed uh, natural gas supply. Um, hydrogen vehicle dispensing, depending on whether you're doing a, a, a light duty or medium duty, you might need an extra set of compressors there, uh, light duty vehicles. Um, uh, the dispensing stations operate at a pretty high, high pressure, so you will need um, some level of additional compression there, uh, potentially. And then um, I've also got a fuel cell there at the bottom that's uh, feeding power over to, uh, to a microgrid uh, substation. And then finally, you know, as you're uh, generating uh, 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 electricity through the fuel cell, um, there will be some uh, water that's being generated that can be recirculated over to the, uh, to the power supply. And then, of course, your, uh, your generation can also feed right into that substation, so I show that as well. Oh, yeah, I didn't notice. Um, I also added the, uh, the optional battery there um, in case, you know, the, 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 your, your hydrogen does act as a, uh, as a, as a long-term energy storage. 
uh, device, but um, a lot of times it's really good, uh, good practice to integrate a, a short-term battery. Um, so yeah, that's I showed it there. So some design considerations whenever you're thinking about um, uh, uh, designing a, a hydrogen microgrid. In order for it to be a true green microgrid, the electrolyzer needs to be powered by a zero carbon energy source. So it can be wind, solar, uh, nuclear, hydro. Um, the important thing is that it needs to be powered, you need to be generating your hydrogen using excess power. So um, whenever demand is not there, that excess power can be used for hydrogen. If, you do, if you're using power from, uh, from your renewable generation and there is demand on the grid, then you're essentially just, you know, you're asking a, uh, um, you're, you're pulling that power that you would otherwise pull, uh, put in the grid by a fossil uh, generated resource. So you're kind of defeating the purpose of having a green microgrid. Um, your inverters need to be sized to handle the renewables and uh, the storage electrical flows. Um, batteries need to be sized to handle all uh, demands and the, um, the hydrogen generator um, can be used to generate uh, hydrogen once a battery is, is, is discharged. So um, the hydrogen storage needs to be, uh, needs to be sized to uh, last a desired time beyond the battery, uh, the battery discharge. You also need to take into consideration how long do you want the storage to, uh, to last? Is it a matter of hours, is it days, is it weeks, months? Um, that's really going to drive your decision on how much storage you're going to need and help you uh, determine whether or not you're going to want above ground or below ground storage or some other type of, uh, uh, some other type of uh, storage uh, system. So the fuel cell needs to be also sized to handle all the loads after the battery is depleted. You definitely don't want to undersize that and uh, um, you know, compromise the, uh, the reliability of the, of the system. Uh, the control logic system needs to be capable of managing the power in and out. Uh, perhaps you want to integrate some logic in there about looking at, uh, at power prices to the wide area grid and talk about integrating a system like what I described earlier where um, you're disconnecting uh, uh, power when, 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 when power is expensive. And um, the, the bottom uh, um, consideration there is, you know, you want to also take into consideration what's your long-term goal? What's, are you going to have future loads that are, um, uh, that are going to come on to your, uh, to your microgrid? So you might want to scale your, your fuel cell to, uh, to accommodate those future resources or perhaps, you know, your, um, uh, uh, think about um, what other off-takers you might have that will drive the, uh, the size of the electrolyzer or your storage. So a little bit about, uh, about safety. Um, so hydrogen is explosive. Um, it's highly flammable and it can ignite or explode if it comes into contact with an ignition source. Um, so to address this risk, um, you know, consider uh, uh, designing your, uh, your microgrid with adequate ventilation, uh, leak detection systems, and uh, fire suppression systems. Um, there are material comp compatibility issues with, uh, with hydrogen. So it can interact with, uh, with certain materials. Uh, there's a lot of work being done in the R&D space on uh, materials and their um, interactions with, uh, with hydrogen. So um, you need to take those into consideration and um, uh, so carefully select materials that are appropriate for your application. Um, hydrogen is often stored in, uh, in a high pressure um, uh, environment, so um, you know, this can itself uh, pose some risks if the pressure is not uh, properly regulated. So um, you know, make sure that you integrate uh, pressure relief valves, rupture discs, and other safety features um, into your system to prevent overpressurization and, and, and prevent risk. Then finally, you know, educating, and this is not just educating your workforce, but also the community around you. Um, you know, this is a, a nascent industry, and a lot of people have a lot of skepticism behind uh, behind hydrogen. So I think the uh, the, the education of the uh, the community is uh, is important. So a little bit about um, some installations that we have here domestically. I, I selected three of them. Uh, we have several uh, all, over, uh, all over the nation and all over the world. These are by no means shape or form, you know, anything that I, uh, that, you know, um, that we uh, uh, say that this is the best microgrid, but uh, these are really good examples of um, success stories of uh, hydrogen microgrids. So um, this is a uh, microgrid over at uh, UC Irvine. Um, I think this, uh, this microgrid uh, started being developed in the mid-2000s. It um, consists of a, a four megawatt uh, uh, solar PV, um, has both rooftop and PV access to, uh, tracking uh, panels. Um, they also have a 19 megawatt combined cycle on site. Um, they incorporate central chilling and, uh, and heating, and it includes one of the largest domestic thermal uh, storage tanks. 
Um, they have a, a 60 kilowatt electrolyzer on site, pretty small electrolyzer, but um, it has the capability of providing, uh, providing fuel for a uh, on-site hydrogen fueling station, which um, uh, provides a, um, 180 kilo kilograms per day. Um, they have also in incorporated advanced energy and efficiency, uh, energy efficiency and controls. Um, SoCal Energy Resource Center um, is a, a, a pretty new uh, um, uh, microgrid. I think they started up in the past uh, past year or two. Um, they have a, a, a solar power uh, PEM electrolyzer, um, also integrates some uh, uh, hydrogen storage and a hydrogen fuel cell. And they have the ability to what uh, to blend up to 20% with natural gas to what uh, uh, um, uh, for the home's gas appliances, and this is what makes this uh, this one particular microgrid uh, pretty uh, pretty unique. Um, it's a pretty small microgrid, but it's it's really a uh, a mini version of what can be um, implemented at scale in order to power uh, realistically power a home on 100% uh, uh, renewable hydrogen. So. Um, you know the uh, the fuel cell provides power to the uh, to the home, and then of course you know the uh, the, 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 the as I mentioned the uh, they have the capability to blend uh, hydrogen into uh, uh, to power the uh, the homes of uh, uh, gas appliances. And then last but not least, the uh, Champaign Urbana uh, Mass Transit District they have a uh, integrated a uh, hydrogen bus fleet and fueling station into the uh, their bus depot. So. Um, here they have a, uh, uh, a two megawatt solar array uh, that's located across the street from their home, from their bus depot. Um, it's actually located, uh, co-located where their um, uh, water treatment plant is. Um, they feed the uh, the power directly to the uh, to the uh, across the street to the uh, to the bus depot. Um, that power is used to uh, to power a one megawatt uh, PEM electrolyzer. It's capable of producing 420 kilograms of uh, production of hydrogen. Um, it currently supplies only uh, two 60-foot uh, fuel cell electric buses, but they have plans for, uh, for expansion to 26 fuel cell electric buses. Um, so 20, 40-foot and 60-foot uh, um, uh, buses. So um, they've had pretty good success with it. They're still learning a lot, and, um, uh, but it's a, a great example of a, of a successful uh, um, you know, um, application of hydrogen. So uh, just to conclude here, you know, microgrids offer an innovative and sustainable solution for meeting electric and energy needs in a variety of applications. Hydrogen is a versatile and clean burning fuel that can be produced from a variety of, of new resources. So um, the adoption of, of uh, hydrogen microgrids is expected to accelerate in the coming years, driven by growing demand for clean energy advancements in hydrogen production and storage technologies and favorable policy and regulatory environments. There's still a lot of challenges to be addressed, uh, but the, uh, the potential benefits of hydrogen microgrids make them a promising solution for the future. So uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll close. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Mahendra, uh, the, uh, one of the things that you see, Irvine, for example, microgrid, is that uh, tied through the grid? I don't know. Yeah, I um, I believe it is, but I, I don't know for sure. Just to fo um, just to follow up on that, my one of the things that we are uh, thinking about is if you have a standalone based on hydrogen without battery and with a fuel cell in it. I mean, uh, when there's no load, what do you do with it? Uh, the, can you turn the fuel cell down? I, yeah, I, I believe I, I believe there is some uh, uh, turn down capability, but um, you know, you can also just yeah, you can just turn it off if you don't if you don't have the demand. I think maybe maybe you might know better than me on the turn down capabilities of a fuel yeah. cell. If it's a PEM uh, electrolyzer fuel cell, it's easy to turn up and down. It's only 60 degrees to 70 degrees. You have to go up and down. Uh, so if it's a SOFC, it's different. Got you. Thank you.
Okay, a big hand for Joe. Thank you. All right, so uh, now we're going to try to uh, tr transition into our uh, panel discussion. But um, unfortunately, uh, our friends from Louisville Gas and Electric, who was going to serve on our panelists, uh, they're out getting the last uh, 100 or so people's uh, electricity back on. So it's kind of a all hands on deck, you know, when uh, I think that's an interesting aspect for these microgrid projects is that, you know, if, if your system depends on your microgrid to supply your electricity, then it's a 24 by 7. Uh, dedicated uh, operations. So, so maybe for this uh, panel, we're going to take just a slightly different uh, approach. Uh, Mr. Jacob Vitito is with Scale Microgrid Systems. He's an alumni of, of our program. So, so Jacob, maybe we'll have you come up and just uh, give your slides, and then, and then I'd like to invite all the speakers from this session to be on the panel uh, since uh, we we're missing a few panelists. So, so if we want to let uh, Jacob give his talk, and then, and then we'll all come up and, and then we can ask questions. All right. So. So Jacob, if you want to introduce yourself, and uh, thanks for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to, to come and serve on the panel today. I've been looking forward to learning more about uh, clean hydrogen and how clean hydrogen can play a part in broader decarbonization and, and from my perspective, in, in microgrids more broadly. Um, so I, I, we're all excited to get to the Q&A portion, so I'll try and keep my uh, my introduction of myself brief. Uh, so my name is Jacob Vitito. I'm a power engineer at Scale Microgrids, and I'll talk a little bit about Scale Microgrids and who we are and what we do here in just a minute. Um, I, as uh, Dr. McIntyre mentioned, I'm also a alumnus of the University of Louisville, um, and I have taken what I have found to be a rather unusual path into um, the renewable energy space in my career, uh, starting my career in what you would consider more traditional power generation, fossil fuel generation, and more traditional electrical energy system design, first with uh, Louisville Gas and Electric and then with uh, CNI Engineering here in Louisville. So keenly uh, interested in what's going on in the state of Kentucky and what developments are being made. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, who Scale Microgrid Solutions, uh, now Scale Microgrids, who we are and what we do. Um, so Scale Microgrids is a a distributed energy resource project developer, project financier, owner, and operator. So um, we find that when we talk to customers who are interested in, in deploying microgrids for their business, for their university, for their municipality, there are lots of barriers to entry to figuring out how to deploy practically your microgrid. There are the technical challenges, there are the regulatory challenges, there can be financial challenges. You know, how do you finance what is a fairly large upfront capital expenditure to overhaul your electrical system? So Scale Microgrids as an organization aims to vertically integrate all of those functions and bring them under one umbrella so that from the perspective of the customer who wants to deploy their microgrid, we are sort of their one-stop shop to go from early stage conceptualization and right sizing their microgrid for their application all the way through construction, commissioning, and oftentimes for 15 or 25 years afterwards as their, their owner, operator, and their maintenance provider for those assets as well. So the goal is that by lowering those barriers to entry, we will increase the proliferation of microgrids as a technique for industrial decarbonization um, and, and make it adaptable for needs of different geographies and uh, different customer load profiles. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about what is a microgrid. Microgrids can take lots of different forms, but to, to scale microgrids, what it typically looks like uh, is what you see here. You know, you have a, a single customer facility, whether it be industrial, whether it be municipal, whether it be a, a university, 
And so what we do is we bring in the, the electrical distribution required to tie these disparate distributed energy resources together and help develop the control system that oversees the autonomous operation of all of those distributed energy resources to meet you know, real-time load, which real-time loads, depending on the facility, can be very dynamic, they can be very seasonal. So a lot of what we do is focused on the right sizing and the right composition of the technology to meet that particular, um, that particular customer need, whether their focus be as much decarbonization as possible, whether it be the most resiliency that they can get out of their on-site system, or the most uh, savings against their traditional utility bill. So to sort of elaborate on that a little bit further, uh, the technologies that we usually deploy, we can kind of categorize in a few groups here. Um, there's the overarching microgrid controls. Uh, there are non-dispatchable forms of generation, which you know we talked a little bit yesterday about uh, solar as an example of, you know, you, you take what you can get with solar, and there are advantages to that and some challenges to that. So by coupling your non-dispatchable generation with different forms of energy storage and dispatchable generation, whether that dispatchable generation currently be a, a low carbon natural gas uh, generator set source or in the not so distant future be a hydrogen powered fuel cell for instance, um, you're able to cover a, a wide variety of, of different load profiles and different customer needs with that microgrid. Um, and I, I want to highlight a little bit um, the zero EV, inf the, uh, zero EV uh, infrastructure piece of the microgrid. Um, there's a really interesting symbiotic relationship between on-site generation and fleet electrification. A lot of people who are coming to us now interested in microgrids are doing so because they say, you know, we're a, we're a warehousing facility and we have 30 large trucks and we want to electrify our entire fleet, but, you know, we're in an area where maybe the grid is constrained. You know, the utility says we can't physically provide you with that power in the near future because of you know, constraints on the size of the wires or constraints on you know, transformers in the nearest substation or whatever the case might be. So we are able to come in and supplement their utility connection with on-site low carbon generation sources to allow them to electrify their fleet without incurring costly utility upgrades and all the, you know, the long schedule that comes with that, the high complexity that comes with that. Um, so I, I just wanted to point out that there's all of these different pieces that we've talked about over the last day and a half between clean hydrogen and industrial decarbonization and electric vehicles, all of these things are very much tied together into one ecosystem. Um, so part of what makes our approach unique, in, in the past, microgrids were highly complicated, bespoke systems. You know, you would, de you would develop a solution that addressed the needs of one facility, you know, and you spent a lot of time and money and energy addressing that one facility's needs. On scale microgrids, we are really driving towards a more <laughs> modular, repeatable solution, a more modular, repeatable approach to the deployment of microgrids to reduce the time, reduce the cost, and increase the proliferation of microgrids. And one of the ways that we do that is working with a, a sort of a, we, we would think of it as like a menu of, of manufacturers whose technology we understand, we have developed relationships with, and we have had success deploying with in different microgrids. So we're able to draw from some of the, you know, the, the bigger household names in distributed energy, whether it be uh, Schneider Electric or Mitsubishi or Tesla. And we're able to, to sort of assemble a microgrid system out of these understood uh, technologies to best suit the needs of a particular customer. Uh, so just talk a little bit about our, our footprint. Um, so scale microgrids has historically been uh, uh, concentrated on the East Coast and the West Coast, uh, largely because of the favorable regulatory environments. And you know there, there's a lot of um, incentive to to build in these areas. These are places that have really um, you know put you know put the first foot forward into wide scale decarbonization. Um, and as we deploy more and more of these microgrid systems, I mean it. 
you know, the, the scale at which we are deploying, at which these systems are being deployed is, is growing year over year. Uh, you know, we're going to see these numbers continue to grow. You know, the amount of, of money we're able to save our customers, the amount of avoided outage hours, the, the overall decarbonization impact that we're able to have with the microgrid systems. So I'm going to end just by uh, highlighting a particularly interesting um, case study that, uh, that we are currently developing. So we have been, for the last several years, developing a microgrid project with uh, Gallaudet University. Gallaudet University is uh, unique and interesting in a lot of ways. Um, one of them is that it is considered the nation's premier secondary uh, education for the deaf and hard of hearing. And in addition to being an institute of higher education, it also serves as a community for the deaf, of hard of hearing, the deaf and hard of hearing, so much so that there are um, you know, there are families who don't just work at Gallaudet University, but live on its campus. So for them, the question of, of energy independence and the question of uh, reliability and decarbonization is more personal than just the operations of the university. You know, it, it affects people's lives as well. So uh, this, uh, this is a particularly interesting project because it really brings together so many of these different aspects of microgrid technology from uh, about two and a half megawatts of uh, PV solar that is scattered across the campus and tied in locally to its to their load centers, but controlled from a central uh, microgrid control system that also interacts with uh, a, a battery energy storage system and about four and a half megawatts of natural gas powered uh, combined heating and cooling generator sets. So. When, you know, when this microgrid is, is completed, which, which is not particularly far off now, um, it's going to be doing a lot to uh, you know, aid and, and serve the, both the electrical and the thermal needs of a, you know, a institution of higher learning and a community that will benefit a lot from what the microgrid can bring them. So uh, thank you very much. So if we can move into our panel discussion uh, period, that would that'd be great. Um, so I invite all of our speakers um, from this session to come up. We've rearranged the table a little bit here. Um, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, I have some prepared questions for the panel. I was going to present something for a moment. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so we can start with Mr. Yeah, All right. There you go. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, we're so grateful that, uh, for our, for our panel today, and and we'll just have some questions. I've got some prepared questions, but. Uh, I strongly encourage the audience to jump in as well. Um, so, so for the panel, you know, we've seen different flavors of microgrids, um, whether it's a nano grid, as Alan, as you threw that term out there, we heard that yesterday as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm great. I'm grateful that some of you all, uh, you know, put out a definition of a microgrid. I guess, I guess, maybe let's start with that. Do we, do we agree with uh, Joe's definition of a microgrid? I think you mentioned. Uh, I wrote it down just in case. Uh, uh, it's, it's local. Uh, can be independent or not, uh, and then it's intelligent in its decision making. What do we think? Does everybody agree with that that definition? Anything we, we'd like to add? I, I just add. Um, I, I think you did mention out there in a few other sessions that that storage was was typically a, a component of a microgrid. Um, the only challenge I would have to that is if you do have an asset that basically runs 24 7 365 i'm not trying to promote bloom here honestly and <laughs> uh, you have a source of redundancy for your fuel source you may not actually have to have storage um, other than maybe short-term storage that's built into the ups for power electronics and things like that within the system so i guess my point is there are some options mm. uh, but typically yeah, we would have storage great, great. <laughs> That's uh, been something that I had wanted to highlight in my uh, presentation that helps answer the question. Um, regarding whether or not the microgrid um, can, you know, can be independent, cannot be independent of the grid, oftentimes we find in the systems that we design that it's both. You know, the system is capable of 
grid tied operation for as long as the utility is there and you know we have all of the systems in place to you know have the the two levels of protection us from the utility the utility from the microgrid system um, but also that the system is capable of islanding in cases where the utility is not available to serve the load so the the most value uh, we found comes from being able to do both you know from being able to operate in parallel with the utility and to be autonomous as a power system yeah, yeah. Right. sorry just following no, no. on what you said um, you know, I, I think some of the, you know, I, obviously we, I would promote the same thing. Having a grid connection does add for that level of reliability. Um, commercially, there are some challenges. Um, there are some utilities that make interconnection extremely difficult or extremely expensive. So it is definitely a limitation as far as the application of that microgrid in the region in which you're connecting, just based on the local utility. Very, very, all right. Um, so how does the panel see the role of hydrogen microgrids evolving into the future? Uh, Joe, you had showed us some, some examples of hydrogen microgrids that, that, that you're aware of. I don't know if, uh, if Jacob, if you can share any details of any hydrogen-oriented microgrids, but, but, but how do we see that evolving in the future? Uh, we've, we've leaned heavily on the phrase tool in the toolkit here over the last day and a half, and I, and I think um, that, that really is spot on when it comes to hydrogen's role in, in distributed energy and in, in microgrids. It, it's, it's much as, I think it's gonna follow a similar curve that lithium ion battery storage followed where you know, maybe early deployments were you know, not all the way there in terms of the technology or the reliability or maybe even just the cost profile. But as the technology improves and as the number of deployments improve and there's operating history, and people really understand what the benefits and limitations of the technology are, I, I think that you know, something like a, a, a clean hydrogen source that's able to be either stored on site or produced nearby is, is a very valuable thing to have for microgrid, whether it be grid tied or off grid. Yeah, you know, last night we were talking about um, you know, where uh, hydrogen currently is as far as uh, uh, the TRL, um, just you know how, how comfortable everybody is in the industry is. Um, a lot of skepticism out there, but you know um, I always go back to if you think about where we were with uh, with PV solar um, in the late 2000s. You know we were at 25 cents per kilowatt um, a kilowatt hour, and it was very uncompetitive versus uh, traditional uh, generation. And you know it was subsidies that got us. Um, to where we are now, and uh, now we have a very robust uh, supply chain. Uh, we've made advancements in technology, and we continue to make those advancements. And I think, you know, um, programs like the IIJA and the IRA are really going to uh, drive a lot of that innovation for uh, for hydrogen, and um, hopefully, you know, bring down the, uh, the power prices or the prices of, uh, of, of hydrogen to to a point that's competitive with traditional fuels. Yeah, I see that I get a lot of questions from customers around safety of hydrogen in general. So I think there's an educational hurdle uh, to get over to, to, to drive that adoption. You know, I hear things like, well, I don't, I don't want to bomb underneath my car. I don't want high pressure hydrogen stored outside my facility, right? So I think there is a bit of education just in the consumer space about what that really means and how safe the application really is. Yeah. I think that's an extremely good point because most of the people that we talk with and we're not in our group, the hydrogen experts by any stretch, that's the things that we hear. And I think it's it, uh, maybe because they feel like they can commiserate with us. I don't know, but, <laughs> but, uh, but I, think it, I think that's a very good point, that, that uh, a campaign that, that focuses on the safety and, what, and, and if there are any concerns, uh, what are they and how they've been mitigated? Yeah. You know, through the technologies that have been developed or being deployed, uh, because everybody's gonna think, you know, Zeppelin, you know, I mean, boom, there I go. So, I, yeah, I mean, it's just stuck in people's minds, and I think that's something that you, you can address with proper education. I agree with that. Yeah. One question that I would, I would uh, have in my mind, though, as it relates to some of these technologies is, where do you see the, the low-hanging fruit to start driving out cost? What is it that takes it from the 5 to $7 down to, uh, in, even in, in the presence of subsidies? What, what takes out the cost? I'll add my thoughts on that just from a commercial perspective. You know, one of the things that, that we work really hard at at Bloom is, is driving down that cost. But in order to do that, we need money. 
and in order to get money, we have to have sales. So it's kind of a chicken and egg, right? We, we've got a product, we want to deploy it, we're looking for end users. If we don't find them, we can't fund additional research because we are a public company, we're for profit. So there are some challenges within, within our world to do that. To your earlier point, is there a way of future-proofing the early adopter? Uh, you know, you said it might not be quite as efficient or it might not be, is there a way of making a business arrangement that helps future-proof them when things do improve and better technology comes along, like we see in electronics, for example? Is there a way of doing that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, yeah to the question about um, sort of assuring early adopters and you know a lot of that comes down to understanding the technology conceptually both for the microgrid system developer and for the end user you know you sort of have to have an idea of what the the benefits and risks are of the technology as it currently exists you know you can't reach into the future and grab a better version you have with what you have um, and then there's a lot this sort of goes back to what I had to say about the different barriers for entry. You know, the, the commercial hurdles and the financial hurdles really do dampen a lot of technology proliferation because n nobody wants to have unit number one of anything. Mm -hmm. You know, no, nobody who's relying on a piece of technology for the reliability of their system wants to be, you know, the beta version of that product. So, you know, it, really, it. For, for a developer, it comes down to um, the company being willing to sort of backstop the reliability of that equipment and take ownership of it if you know something doesn't behave as it's expected to. You know, a, a, a warranty that you can stand behind, a, a, a plan that you can stand behind for when you know things inevitably do happen. You know, with a new technology or, or even an existing technology, you kind of have to have that contingency ready to go. Uh, we have a question from the uh, audience, real quick. Well, he's getting that done. One of you all have a did, Joe. Did you want to add to that last point, or did we cut you off? Yeah, I think that um, you know one of the other um, things that uh, that came to mind whenever we were talking about you know what what it takes to get uh, um, get somebody comfortable. You know, and uh, we we see. Um, some, a lot of potential being driven by uh, subsidies, but um, you know, we're also seeing a lot of private industry adopting net zero goals, and um, there's a lot of uh, stigma that's uh, positive stigma. I think that's uh, that's carried in, you know, as a consumer and knowing that you're buying your goods uh, from somebody who's who's got um, sustainability and the environment in mind, and I think that's a very big driver. And you know, um, in locations where there isn't a um, you know, a financial incentive, at least you've got your customer base incentive that will hopefully bring in, you know, some uh, some revenue and some income to the for-profit agencies and, you know, it'll drive a lot more, uh, a lot more focus into, uh, into advancements in the technology and hopefully drive down price, so. Uh, Thank you. Just wanted to follow up on the earlier question, actually, they were saying something about connecting the microgrid to the main grid and there are challenges. Can you elaborate a little bit on that because uh, is the utility charges or the demands of this charge if you just have a connection and you don't use it also? Yeah, so so the second part of that is correct. Um, you know, when, when we're running the financial models for our projects and we are interconnected to the grid, our customers understand that they're going to get, you know, most, some, or all their power from the fuel cell, but maintaining that connection to the grid, still they still have to pay some charges, right, to have the connection, have the electricity available, so that's still there. Um, my point was more around some utilities simply will not let you interconnect based on the type of DR asset that you're trying to connect. Um, so certain parts of the country, even you know stateside, um, it, there's there's very long wait times, a lot of challenges depending on the asset type and that that sort of thing. We we do see that um, some utilities will make it extremely expensive. Um, there are a, a smaller utility company in California, for example, it's a one million dollar charge to run an interconnection application. Just, just to send it in, right? So it does incentivize you a bit to, to try to interconnect in the region, and they know that, and that's exactly why they have that charge. I, I can talk for a long time about interconnection. Um, <laughs> so as I alluded to earlier, you know, coming from a, a bit of the, the traditional power generation, a, a big part of what I do at Scale Microgrids is our interconnection applications for the majority of our projects. I mean, I, I interact daily 
with a host of utilities on, on, on both coasts. Um, and, and really, one of the challenges is that it's, it's sort of a, it's a patchwork <laughs> of requirements. You know, uh, every utility has a different approach to addressing the same types of concerns. And, and the concerns are all driven by, you know, their system has to stay reliable, their system has to stay safe, their people have to stay safe, and, you know, they don't have complete control over what your microgrid is, is doing. So, you know, th there have to be fail-safes in place for the utility, and, and, and all of that makes perfect sense. But part of the, the, the difficulty in deployment is the way utility A does that and the way utility B does that might be fairly different uh, both in terms of the, the requirements that they put on and also the, you know, as David alluded to, the cost structure, you know, it, part of that, that whole barrier for entry discussion again. Um, so I, I think from the perspective of somebody who works in industry, I'm always keenly interested in what can be done to better uh, unify the approach. You know, how, how can we start the dialogue that helps make utility A and their requirements look more like utility B and their requirements, irrespective of geography, and we haven't quite gotten there yet. Hugh and Dan Enro. I want to comment about what Alan was asking earlier about how to de-risk. Um, referring back to my presentation yesterday, one of the ways to, I think, penetrate the market is going after the um, applications that are willing to pay high costs of hydrogen start there and, and then eventually go down to those applications that require really low uh, hydrogen costs. Uh, that's one way. And the other way, I think, is, is what um, we're doing at NREL also is um, trying to integrate them at large scale and trying to de-risk that for the companies uh, before they actually go to really large, large scale. Um, those are my comments regarding that. My question is, um, with these microgrids, um, what are the um, integration issues um, that you see with this, or are you being observing for uh, you know, all these things? Because you have all these different components and you're trying to integrate them together. What are the top issues? I mean, one of the things I heard in the file back was power electronics and like inverters, and there's a whole workshop on that, just to try to see if that will be able to address the, the integration issues. Um, I'll start with that one. Um, so what we typically do um, is we work with the third parties that manufacture and produce microgrid controllers, uh, for example. And one of the things that they'll do is run through a series of modeling with the inverters on our product to make sure that you know, they integrate well, that the communication protocols work, and, and there's pretty extensive thorough testing required for us. And typically that requires us to get on sort of a pre-approved technology list uh, shows that we've been vetted technically that the assets integrate together and then we typically do that again on a project basis just to make sure that in the field at that facility it still works as designed based on the modeling. Um, that's typically how we do it. Um, when I add to that? I know it's your world, sir. <laughs> um, so when you're working with disparate technologies from disparate OEMs, a lot of times the, the approach to the control is different. And, and it can be things that are, seem fairly innocuous in a vacuum, like, well, my inverter speaks Modbus, and my inverter speaks IEC 61850 and nothing else. And my inverter only responds to your cloud-based proprietary communications protocol. And, but you have to have one microgrid controller that can talk to all of those systems and do so quickly enough to, I mean, when you're working with electricity, Seconds is not is not fast enough. You know things can change in a matter of, of cycles. You know fractions of seconds. So um, when it comes to the integration side, it's always it's always interesting when you're working with a new technology to understand. You know how does it fit into the profile of these other things that we already have worked with in the past in terms of how do we talk to it? How quickly does it respond when we need it to respond? You know can it do so reliably? What are its limitations in terms of, of the, ramp, you know, the, the ramp rate getting to the power electronics. Um, so all of those things have to be taken into account when you're you know, going to deploy a completed system for the application. Can I jump in here on that? Please. Yeah. <laughs> Please yeah. You guys have been such a great client. You've all, uh, you're, you're taking all my questions, by the way, so, so I'm great. But you know, as a controls person, this is a, uh, an area of research I'm very interested in. And I, I gave a presentation earlier uh, this semester uh, that, you know, on this very topic. And that was one of the questions I, I wanted to ask the panel. 
it, it seems to me in the microgrid space, with or without hydrogen grid connected or not, you know, is there a unified controller uh, or scheme? And I, and I think the answer is no, that it's basically a, a patchwork of, of solutions with different communication uh, protocols and uh, but that's one thing I wanted to point out to you know really the audience as well is when we think about microgrid control, you know we're really controlling a bunch of individual pieces as you said. So so really as I see it, and and, and this is a you know a figure I've uh, poached from a paper and I, I reference it here. But we really have things that have to happen on the millisecond or even you know faster now as we think about GAN and wide band gap devices where it's really nanoseconds. Uh, so things have to happen at this level so that we can monitor the you know the very fast load shedding the the voltage regulation the voltage stability frequency type problems and then there's a time continuum a continuum all the way to the minutes or days or hours for the forecasting piece that you mentioned Alan so I just want you know as we think about microgrids and microgrid controllers or microgrid systems with or without hydrogen there's really things that have to happen down here in the ultra fast level and then there's this quasi centralized piece and then this forecasting optimization AI oriented type of thing. So, so are we seeing all of this come to play in microgrid systems as, as exists now? But it's just kind of a patchwork that's put together. Seems like a real opportunity to me. I guess the short answer is, is yes. The, the centralized microgrid controller, there are products commercially available on the market in, in different forms. Um, but when it comes to the integration of the individual assets, t typically the commercial approach is that the, the original equipment manufacturer for your battery system or for your PV system will have their own, you know, centralized controller for just their group of assets. You know, they have one hub that talks to all of their inverters, talks to their battery management system, whatever the case might be. And so the, the challenge is always, you know, take, you know, you basically have you know, a, um, a group of central microgrid controllers reporting up to one, mm -hmm. um, you know, true, I guess, master microgrid controller. And, and um, the products are definitely out there, but every time you approach a new, a new product or even just from a new equipment manufacturer, there's kind of a, a you know, you have to relearn a little bit um, how, to, how to approach the problem. Um, yeah, absolutely a patchwork, and, and companies are taking a very different approach, so I'll give you a couple examples. Um, some of the larger name uh, uh, electrical switch here, OEMs, I won't say their names, but I think we all kind of know who they are. Um, you know, some of them will take a, a platform that they use for power plant controls, like, like centralized power plant controls, and they modify that software and that platform to fit for microgrid controls. Um, so, so they're kind of, you know, taking a tool they already had and then sort of modifying it to fit the market needs. Okay, other companies understand it from a different perspective where they're going out and saying, what are the emerging technologies? If I want to sell you a microgrid controller, I better make sure it works with X, Y, Z, and all these different technologies. So they're sort of taking a bottom-up development approach rather than trying to modify something that's already existed for 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing quite a bit of variance out there. Yeah, I'll just say that the, the architecture that I referred to was more that latter approach, which yeah. was a bottom-up approach to try to provide you know, a cyber hardened solution, mm -hmm. but it had to account for all the different communication protocols and other types of things that you would have to, to encounter just to, to control grid grid based assets and, and so forth. So, you know, because you know, everybody has their own standard, I guess. But, uh, and so, you know, that's, that's part of what we have to deal with. Um, I do feel like that you end up with a richer set when someone takes that approach, because then, then it's still, designed in that way, it sort of has a little bit more flexibility mm -hmm. to be adaptable. At least it has the right I.O. Right. You know? yeah. Yeah. I, I guess that's one question I'd ask for you, Joe, with EPRI. Does EPRI have a, a view? I know EPRI has released some standards in the past to try to connect. I think, I think some work I've done with GE Appliances, there was a sta an EPRI-based standard that they integrated in their, into their hot water heating system so that the utilities could send out these signals, as you mentioned, to a high pricing point. Yeah. Is, does EPRI see their role uh, as a standards agency, or is that more of an IEEE uh, standards group? Or you know, who, who kind of leads this standardization? Uh, because as we bring hydrogen into it, uh, and, and the technology level that that, that uh, technology, whether it's on the, on the utilization or the generation, um, you, you, we, 
we're definitely picking up a theme here where there's a lot of pieces we're trying to put together and the patchwork of, uh, of standardization doesn't really seem to be there at, at, at this time. Yeah, I mean, I definitely see, you know, Equi as being a really good fit to um, really um, lead such an effort. Um, you know, I don't know that uh, if, if we are uh, doing any work right now, it could very well be that, you know, we are working with manufacturers on this, but I'm not personally aware of them. Um, I, you know, this has been an enlightening kind of uh, discussion for me personally, and I kind of equate it to, you know, if, uh, if you're building a smart home, you can go with uh, with the you know Apple Home or Samsung, or you can go with uh, Alexa. But now you know if we've integrated Matter, and uh, Matter's kind of just taken all these major manufacturers and standardized their uh, communications protocols. And I see this as a very very similar type uh, type problem that I think um, um, every you know can uh, can potentially um, you know look into and seeing if we can we can develop some standards. So I'll, I'll uh, definitely going to take this conversation back home with me and, uh, and see what we can do. While we mentioned cybersecurity, I took a question uh, for you, Alan. Uh, you know, where do we see in the in the microgrid space? You know, um, some of the cybersecurity challenges as as it as as they have arisen. Well, I, I don't think the challenges are particularly unique okay. microgrids. I'll say. I mean, I think any connected system, and and these are going to be connected systems where we're trying to to monitor and manage energy flow and and assets. Um, I think there's there's a need to, to do the things that we would like to see done, quite frankly, um, in substations that have automation and other things. Uh, that they have real-time controllers and, and other types of assets in those substations, and they need to be protected from a, 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 an array of possible attacks as it relates to an attack surface, whether it's a physical thumb drive being plugged in, or, or, or it's, it's, it's network um, spoofing, uh, whatever the case may be. And I think microgrids are no worse or better in that regard in terms of their vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And then of course, per solution, of course, that's, uh, that's a different matter. I mean, I think you, you know, there's probably gonna be better and, and worse uh, solutions. But, you know, I, it, in general, I don't think it's, um, it, there's a need to raise an alarm mm -hmm. because we have, uh, if you were to answer it at a very high level, more microgrid penetration in our nation's grid does not is not cause for concern from a cyber perspective as long as they're paying attention to that aspect in the same way that our grid operators are. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there's some compliance there, because I think our, our grid operators actually do a very good job of, of managing cybersecurity and there and it is a an ongoing thing, an ongoing improvement cycle. So in that regard, because I'm exposed to that part of it, maybe not so much on the microgrid, I think if, as long as there's a consistency there mm -hmm. uh, and, a, and a threat sharing and that sort of thing, I think there's, a, I think there's, there's no cause for concern really. It just, it just, it's diligence. Yeah. Question back at you actually on that point. Um, as far as the, 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 the cybersecurity mitigation within power electronics, I'm intrigued by that. Um, do you do you see that as something that that's widely accepted today as a mitigation strategy for companies that are trying to follow you know NIST cybersecurity guidelines, for example? Because um, it's just something that I hadn't really thought about before. It is a patchwork. I mean, there are some that do and some that don't. There are some, uh, and again, I should name names, but there are some companies that are very much sold on trying to provide as secure a solution as they can. They do realize there's non-recoverable engineering costs to do it. So, it, you know, but, but, but because they have to design that in. And there's others that I don't think pay a lot of attention to it. So I think that's part of the conversation you might want to have with people that, yeah. that you work with. Hi, I'm Tim Appleberry with SAVD Solar, so you'll understand the bias behind my question. Um, specifically, I'm interested in how much there is with regard to microgrid continued um, interest in solar efficiency. And uh, also to ask the second part of the question, which is, uh, what are the greatest pain points at industry? Is it real estate? Is it solar tracking? <laughs> uh, 
Um, I guess to answer your first question regarding um, interest in efficiency, uh, certainly. Um, it, it's maybe not the, the top of mind for everybody. You know, Usually when you buy a solar module, you're looking at what is the nameplate wattage value, what is the footprint, and how much of it, how many of them can I fit in whatever space I'm allotted. You know, um, so if that if that you know means that increased efficiency leads to smaller footprint, that's advantageous. If increased efficiency leads to higher wattage at the same footprint, that's also advantageous. But um, you know, typically the interest in solar is um, you know long term energy production. You know, um, as was pointed out uh, in in uh, Dr. Aaron Patrick's. Um, presentation yesterday, you know, when it comes to real-time power production, solar's kind of all over the place. So, but, but you know that when you integrate it into your system. And so the benefit you're looking for is the long-term energy production with, with, you know, little to no, I mean, no fuel cost. You know, that's the, the great benefit to it. Um, in terms of the, the pain points, um, I, I feel like it is somewhat application dependent. Uh, in a lot of ways, it, yeah, it, it, maybe it's real estate. You know, um, sometimes I go into facilities where, you know, it's, it's a warehouse, it's on a lot that's just slightly bigger than the warehouse, and maybe they haven't replaced the roof in 40 years, and that's not, that's not a great place to put a ballasted solar system without doing some repairs, right? Um, so it's, it's the, the solar is great for its, its flexibility and for its reliability. I mean, you, you, you sort of know what you're getting from from solar, and it, and it does so quite well. You know, the technology has gotten very, very good. Um, so I don't think there's like a, I, at least from my perspective, I, I don't think about a single pain point with, with solar as a technology. It's just how does it best fit into the, the application and the unique constraints of that application. And, and yes, space is a big one. I'll comment on you know what I've kind of experienced a very common theme as of you know the past uh, year and a half since we you know started opening back up and uh, you know we're still suffering from the COVID hangover of uh, having a very weak supply chain with some of our components and I think that leads to very long lead times that are often frustrating to to people who are excited to integrate these uh, new types of systems so. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, nobody wants to carry the number one serial number. I think there are some people that do want to carry the number one serial number so that they can say that they're first to market. What I don't want to, what I don't ever hear is, I want to be the number two guy. <laughs> because then you, you know, obvious, for obvious reasons. But um, yeah, I think uh, supply chain and, you know, lead, lead, lead times on uh, some of these components are, are a very big pain point across the board. I'll add a little bit to that. Um, that the storage seems to me to be the, the most uh, biggest pain point when we talk about solar and storage. Um, give you a great example that uh, example I had up there with Taylor Farms Fresh Foods. Um, when our vendor first got the quote for the battery energy storage system uh, in June of 21, uh, we had a certain price at lead time. By December of that same year, that price had tripled and the lead time doubled. So you got that. Yeah. Okay, any other questions for our panels? Yeah, hang on. Hello, I'm Bill Madden. I'm an engineer from Eastern Kentucky. I work for abandoned mine lands here in, in Frankfurt for the Energy and Environmental Cabinet. Uh, I just want to make a shameless plug first. I come to a lot of these conferences being from Eastern Kentucky. Uh, we do need uh, industry, we do need business. Uh, being economically impressed, we hit a lot of the check boxes if you're looking for federal funds. You know, I've talked to Mahindra about um, uh, a grid. I talked to Tim the other day about, you know, some of his biological stuff. Uh, you know, if you have research, if you do have um, pilot projects or small industry, give me a call. You know, we're looking every day. Uh, to my question, um, I've heard a lot about the, you know, breaking hydrogen. I understand the process, but I'll take just cracking water as an example. Uh, you know, you've got hydrogen, you got oxygen. Well, I hear the price of oxygen, of, of hydrogen, what it takes to make it. I've never heard yet, do we save the oxygen? Do we sell the oxygen? Uh, to me, if you make a closed system, you save your hydrogen, you save your oxygen, you run that pure through your electrolyzer, does that improve the efficiency of your electrolyzer versus using 
oxygen, which is 80 or you know, 80 percent nitrogen. Just kind of curious. I've never heard the mm -hmm. the rest of it. I actually cannot answer that question, but I'm going to pass on. But I do want to address the first comment you made. Um, that there's quite a bit of federal funding through the investment uh, through the IRA and. and the infrastructure bill and a lot of that money is going to uh, areas of the country that had previous coal mines and coal plants which Eastern Kentucky certainly qualifies for. Um, my company in particular is looking at ways to leverage those funds for those areas so I'd love to make contact with you we can talk about that later uh, but I cannot answer the hydrogen question. Yeah I'll say you know what little I um, uh, I can about you know repurposing uh, uh, re 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 reutilization of oxygen um, I know that this is something that um, uh, you know, EPRI is starting to become more involved in hydrogen hubs. Um, you know, they, a lot of the, uh, the hydrogen hub participants are looking at strategic locations where they can locate their, uh, their hubs. And a lot of times um, they're considering, you know, industrial complexes um, to provide, you know, as potential off takers for hydrogen. Um, there's also a double benefit of, you know, a lot of these um, industrial uh, end users might also be able to utilize some of that, some of that oxygen byproduct. And of course, you know, there's incentive for the utilities as for-profit agencies to, you know, uh, capitalize on that otherwise waste stream. So um, I know that it's being discussed. Um, at a pilot scale, it's something that, you know, it's, I, I think it's not a big driver, but it's definitely a consideration. Just, just a couple more questions. Uh, one is, how does the panel view hardware in the loop simulation and simulation modeling of microgrid systems in your rollout and development? Is that something that you're considering looking at for integration purposes using simulation modeling tools like that? Or is it kind of try it out and see if it works? Uh, the, uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, it, it is somewhat cost dependent depending upon the project. Um, if it is for a, a project that might be, um, you know, smaller dollar, maybe it's a project where you've done a similar application before and have been able to validate some of that, uh, some of those, you know, control methodologies in the field previously, um, then it, a lot of times what it is, is, is that as a developer, we, we typically do not have the expertise in-house to do our own hardware in the loop testing. Um, you know, we are going to our third party uh, control providers and third party partners and, you know, we, you know, we certainly discuss it. Um, there's always a cost associated with it. So I, I know it's one of the tools that they use um, when they're validating these, these systems prior to deployment. And, and we're, we're keenly interested in the results of the testing, mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't often get into the weeds of the testing itself. Yeah, I think there's an opportunity there because you know some of the challenge that we see when I talk about the testing of our inverters and the integration with microgrid controllers, um, you, you know, a lot of times I hear from these uh, control companies, hey, can we have your fuel cell to do some testing? We want to do full loop testing, yeah. and that's extremely difficult to you know figure out how to even logistically make that happen, right? Um, especially considering the cost of installing it, designing it, and whatnot. And I feel like it's kind of the flip side, you know, where we might say, hey. Can, can you loan us a microgrid controller, for example, so that we can do testing? Um, because we're certainly not gonna go around and be able to purchase a lot of them to do our own testing in-house. So it almost seems to me if there's an environment or labs that, that we could work with to do that type of testing outside of our own companies and own facilities, it'd be very advantageous. Okay. Yeah, he teed that up too perfect. <laughs> and we have a six megawatt facility that is open to users. Yeah. So, so I know that Eaton, and uh, Baldor before they were bought by ABB, um, and um, uh, SNC have all utilized our facility for various things, not necessarily microgrid controllers, but various things. And so, you know, it's it's a facility that there's a fee-based structure for for using it. So, it you know that would be something, and it has many of the assets you'll find in a substation and other things like that. So you could you could uh, you know hook it in. So, thank you. <laughs> to add to that, are you aware that um, I think INL, Idaho National Lab, has the structure to do that as well? Uh, they work with NRL on the um, hardware in the loop, but also I, my question is, are you integrating with nuclear? 
power for this? Um, it's a great question. We actually did work with Idaho National Labs for Electrolyzer. Um, we did 500 hour testing for Electrolyzer in a nuclear application and ended up that it was you know, the highest performing efficiency, which was great press to get. Um, but I wasn't aware of the additional testing that you could do there from a hardware perspective. So I do appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Amir from Bright Night. Uh, I think one of the answers uh, I could resonate a lot with around uh, when the technology is new and the users of the technology kind of do not yet feel the confidence, then that become that aspect becomes more important. And I do have a personal example for that. Before working in the renewables industry, purely renewable industry, I used to, for, to work for a gas turbine manufacturer, midstream gas turbine, and their custom and they provided gas turbines for gen, power generation applications. The customers were either off-grid, remote, offshore customers, or maybe onshore, grid connected, but they heavily relied on those systems. And then the company started branch out into energy storage and start manufacturing energy storage products to market it to the same customer base. And then that's where a lot of uh, eyes start widen because simply because they are used to a lot of re to, to, to reliable power supply and battery just didn't make sense for them in the first place. But then as you start to show them through hardware in the loop, controls hardware in the loop or actual hardware in the loop that integrating a battery storage to your gas turbine may actually not be that, a bad idea if you wanna run uh, on the battery for the first 10, 15, half an hour uh, without having to uh, quickly ramp up or down your gas turbine, uh, that, that they start to like it, and you show it on a hardware in the loop uh, setup that this is actually doable, uh, that's where uh, they start to feel more comfortable. And uh, this actually was a path that we followed in order to get them comfortable and start. Uh, long term effects of like, how could it make more oxygen in the long term? Yeah. yeah, I don't know that you've got the right audience necessarily yeah, for that question, good. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like an excellent question for Josh Spurgeon. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe go back and watch the feed from yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's give a big hand to our panel. Well, uh, before we close out, uh, a couple of things. Um, I want to thank everybody making it to the workshop and also I want to thank all the speakers and panelists for the workshop and I think it's been very well received. Uh, <clears throat> most importantly, I would like to thank Andrew for uh, organizing a variety of things behind the scenes and uh, in front of the scenes as well. Um, and then <clears throat> also thank uh, Laurie and um, the, our uh, Office of uh, Executive Vice President for Research and Innovation at University of Louisville, so helping us along. Um, so throughout this workshop, I, uh, we, um, we've seen a lot of interest from not only from audience, people who are watching and people who couldn't make it to the workshop, uh, emailed it and uh, some of them actually even asked if there's going to be any briefing, debriefing of statement of some sort, like summarizing statement for the workshop. So we're going to work on that. Um, then, uh, because of the way this workshop shaped up uh, in a timely fashion, not only for the, the funding bills and things like that, but also because of the real uh, work uh, of decarbonization is beginning to happen. And uh, so is there an interest in continuing this workshop with the similar kind of themes um, maybe a year from now and having it here again and see how we... So I just want to open it up to limited audience we have right now, but I want to ask that question. We're going to ask that question even on email to everybody. And um, we can have an expanded workshop, uh, you know, and identify some of the things that we thought like were not represented here, in the, you know, during this workshop. So I will open it up and we can have a, a little bit of feedback and see what do we feel about it. And then that gives us a, um, a chance to actually formulate uh, another workshop next yeah. 
Uh, um, personally, I think that this is a, a very urgent issue. So one year may be even too slow, yeah, in my opinion. Maybe we should have like every half a year uh, meeting to to wrap up because the I mean, of course, the technology takes time to develop, but actually we don't have time, and we most of us knows. I mean, we are maybe too late to be honest, but. Uh, this is really where we are, and, and that's why I think it's very urgent that we we push forward the technology and the, the implementation. Okay. Anyone else with a comment you want to make? One more aspect is the uh, timing of the workshop too. I mean, we uh, set it up so that we actually uh, can have a discussion in March, early part of March. That was the one decision we made it, but I think it you know, you guys can chime in on and see what month would be more preferable for companies to come together. I just want to say, uh, I went to the food and energy, uh, well, symposium they had at UK a couple of months ago. Uh, sat through the energy section and we had a lot of grad students there presenting their stuff and Lord knows they, a whole lot smarter than me. I realized how long I've been out of school. Um, but it probably might be good to, to take your grad students while they're, they're studying and, and maybe break it into a couple of two or three, one day, half a day through the year. And let them present their, their findings, bring the industry people in, see if there's anything there that you know they can push on out the door. I, I know you do it anyway, but sometimes it's, it's better to have a, a hands-on than passing letters or emails back and forth. One other question I wanted to find out is what day in a month is usually better than other month. I mean, anybody has any opinion on that? As long as you avoid Q4. It's always a very, very rough quarter for most industry. Most industry, yeah. Good point. Okay. So, with that, Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for contributing to the workshop. And I guess we will be seeing you all again in a year from now, at least. Thank you.